back to the White House Travel Office hearing, this section of the event runs 20 minutes. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will resume its sitting, and I'm now pleased to recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Meek, for five minutes. Can't hear you, Ms. Meek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'm happy that you gave the members of the White House Travel Office a chance to come before the Congress and explain their side of the story. It's unfortunate how things have evolved here. And hopefully that in the end that you will feel better about what happened, even though you had some real personal injury because of this. Uh, I think that as, as far as I can see in listening and having worked in supervisory positions all of my life, that I think that even though Mr. Dale was cleared by the criminal court, and he is not a criminal, he was not dishonest, but what he did, uh, in my opinion, uh, was a fireable offense. And I think the other members of this group are victims of a circumstance. Uh, that they worked for someone who had used, maybe got a little bit callous because of his long years uh, in the White House. But I think that the rest of you are, are, are swept into this because of that kind of thing that happened. And even though they cleared him of it, uh, the internal control, according to what we're reading, and by uh, Mr. Dale's own admission, that he uh, commingled funds, and that he put funds in a personal account. Now, if anyone were to do that, that shows a big uh, glint of impropriety. It's improper to mix those funds. It's improper to set up a personal account and put funds in it that don't belong there, even though he did nothing on the criminal intent. But he knew, having supervised all those years, that that was an improper thing to do because it just made it look like uh, his intent was dishonest, when it really was not. So I think that uh, in his own personal account there, uh, Mr. Dale has a lot of uh, things to look at in his own supervisory manner. The rest of you answer to him. He's responsible for the management style. He's responsible for the procedures of that office. And everything falls in his lap. And uh, the petty cash, which is mentioned here, the jury cleared him, naturally. But they, the jury could clear him of criminal acts. But they cannot clear Mr. Dale, no matter how well intended he is, of shoddy accounting and poor management procedures. So I think Mr. Dale, in my opinion, of all the people here, was the only one should have been fired. I think that the White House uh, may have bungled this matter. They may have bungled it by going in and find the entire staff, instead of if they had some problems with Mr. Dale's administration, it's just like a football coach. All the problems belong on him. Now, they had every right to fire you without bringing up this big quagmire that you're in. If they had wanted to fire you, they could have. That was their prerogative. They were new coming in, just like you come into a new administration, you have every right, but not to uh, blemish your, your, your record by saying that you're guilty of dishonest things. I think the only person here who may have a hint of impropriety is Mr. Dale. And my question to you, Mr. Dale, is, as a longtime supervisor, if someone under your supervision did what you did, would not you censor them or fire them? Not without questioning them. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Mr. Dale. Not without questioning them first. I'd give them a, an opportunity to explain what they were doing. I think you're right about it. I think you should have been given a chance to explain. But once you explain it, or once the facts came out regarding it, you should have been censored. But the staff, the rest of these people here, should not have been fired. Would the gentlelady yield? Yes. 
I, I was wondering, given the criteria she just set out, if the general lady feels that Hazel O'Leary, who has $250,000 of unaccounted travel funds, ought to be fired. Well, that's or okay. before the general lady answers, you continue to yield Ron Brown, who has $24 million in cost overruns on his credit card, should be fired. Well, that brings up another uh, factor there, and you have every right to pursue that one. But I should ask you also, should all these people been fired that got paid for not working during the, the government shutdown? That, to me, was another example of shoddiness and someone not paying attention to the lives of these people. The gentle uh, lady's You had a lot of people time that have been hurt by the shutdown and lost their job. Yes, sir. I'm, <coughs> I'm now pleased to recognize the other gentle lady from uh, Florida, Ms. Eliana ross Leighton, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, before I get into my line of, of questioning, I have the greatest respect for my dear colleague, uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Meek, we had the pleasure of serving together in the Florida House and the Florida Senate for, for many years. But if I could just uh, clear up this time frame issue, uh, let's be clear about this. Uh, uh, these gentlemen were in no way fired for any uh, improprieties of the handling of funds, any, any hint of financial mismanagement. Uh, they were not fired for these actions. They were fired before any management review report came out. Uh, uh, the First Lady indicated that she wanted to fire them. The, the, the replacement she wanted to put in, in their place was already gearing up before there was any hint of that. Uh, as uh, Mr. Dale had pointed out in his testimony uh, this morning, uh, this uh, mismanagement uh, report came after the fact and was what he called a convenient excuse, and I think that's the correct uh, term for it. So let's not uh, mat mismatch the time frame here. They were fired. Then they, the White House found an excuse to justify this uh, unjustifiable action of, uh, of it, uh, firing these individuals. But if I could uh, uh, start with my line of questioning, uh, Mr. Dale, I wondered if uh, you could ask, uh, answer uh, uh, some questions that I have uh, about uh, Catherine uh, Cornelius and the actions uh, of the office. I believe that you might be the, the proper individual to ask, but uh, if others would like to answer, that would be fine as well. If you could tell the committee, what was uh, Catherine uh, Cornelius doing in your office uh, during the week before the firings, and uh, was she in the office uh, very much uh, during that time? No, ma'am. As I remember, Catherine was spending uh, probably six or seven hours of the day out of the office, and one day when she came back, I guess she could sense that I was going to question where she had been, and she volunteered the fact that she was working on a special project for Harry Thomason and the First Lady. Uh, and this special project, do you have uh, any idea of what that special project might have been? Well, my feeling today is that uh, it was the White House Travel Office. Uh, who was she working with during that week? I don't know who Catherine was working with, but I'm sure that she had other people, especially after duty hours that were working with her. Those individuals would be? <coughs> well, there was one young lady that she worked very closely with by the name of Clarissa Serta, who, um, as I understood, had finished law school. She just had not passed the bar exam yet, and she expressed an awful lot of interest in our office also. Uh, you had mentioned uh, Mr. Uh, Harry Thomason. Uh, were you aware of the meetings that uh, uh, Catherine Cornelius uh, had had with, uh, with Mr. Thomason? Well, she had readily admitted that she had been meeting with Harry Thomason that week, but we didn't know what, what the matter was. What did she say about those meetings? Well, she never did say anything about it except for the fact that she told me that she was working on a special project for Harry Thomason and the First Lady. So you were aware of, of these meetings that she had with the, with the First Lady? And what did she say anything about those meetings? Well, she didn't elaborate on those either. I mean, it's, uh, I just assumed that she was working on something outside of the, the White House Travel Office. And did, did you hear uh, Ms. Cornelius talk about her access to the president uh, much at all? Oh, yes. Yeah, so she used to take great delight in boasting to us about the fact that she was the president's cousin. And she told me that uh, she talked to him on three or four times a day. And all she had to do was pick up the phone and call him, and she got right through. 
So it was clear to you that she had access to the president and she made it uh, very clear in, in uh, her discussions with you and the rest of the uh, personnel that she spoke with the president on a regular basis. Yes, she did. Uh, Mr. Watkins, uh, in General his Lady's memo. General time has expired. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, now I recognize the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Collins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield my time to uh, Congressman Carolyn Maloney. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to be associated with the comments of my colleague from Vermont, uh, Mr. Sanders, who uh, expressed his concern for, for all of you. And, and also for any other government employee that has lost their job, the 113 postal workers who lost their jobs were pink slipped, according to the Hill, this week. And the many federal employees during the 21-day shutdown uh, were not able to have money for Christmas. They didn't have very much of a Christmas. Uh, I had one constituent whose son could not even go back to college because of the lack of money and the insecurity that she felt during the government layoffs. I'd like to put in the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, a, a article by uh, Jim Dwyer in the, uh, in the Daily News from uh, January 18th. And in it, uh, he's very critical of Congress. Uh, he says that instead of playing partisan politics, we should be, and he's concerned about the seven jobs that are lost, but he said we should be looking at the 40,000 individuals that lost their jobs from AT&T, the 12,000 individuals who lost their jobs in the merger between uh, Chase and Chemical, the uh, 30,000 who lost their jobs from uh, Sears Roebuck, Boeing laid off 28,000, IBM 63,000, OTE 17,000, Ninex 16,000, AT&T uh, 40,000, Delta Airlines 15,000, Digital Equipment, 20,000. Lockheed Martin, 15,000. And, and here, and I'd like, here's his quote. He said, the seven people in the White House Travel Office are far more important to the Republicans than the quarter million at these companies who lost their jobs. And I'd just like to state that I believe these hearings are, are very uh, partisan. I would like to ask Mr. Dale a question. Mr. Dale, um, serious uh, financial management weaknesses were found by the Pete Marwick firm in its May 1993 review of the travel office. In May 1994, the General Accounting Office in its review uh, concluded, uh, and I quote, serious financial mismanagement. On page three it said, and I quote, GAA's review of records from the travel office and Pete Marwick's work papers, as well as discussions from Pete Mark and former and current White House officials, confirmed that serious financial management weaknesses existed. End quote. Uh, GAO's review confirmed uh, the findings of Pete Marwick and, and pointed out uh, basic mismanagements and, and went through uh, a, a whole lot of findings where they, they thought there were a lot of uh, problems. Uh, Mr. Dale, in your op-ed article in the Washington Post of January 21, re you referred to, and I quote, the so-called financial mismanagement discovered by Pete Marwick. You went on to state that the most serious issue raised by Pete Marwick was your failure to record five petty cash checks totaling 14000 Do you disagree with the GAO findings, the GAO I findings of uh, mismanagement? Do you disagree with them? Yes, I do. Can you explain why? Because I did not have records available to me at the time Pete Marwick came in, or I assumed that those records were not available when the GAO did their investigation or audit of the travel office. If all of my records had been available, there wouldn't have been any question, no question in my mind about that. Um, while you were with the travel office, uh, uh, were you aware that in the 1980s OMB staff found poor financial management practices in the travel office and excess money in its bank account? Did Here you take any actions to improve that? Yes, I did. And that, those, uh, that audit was done before I be assumed the directorship of the office. 
I would like to go, first of all, may I put the article from Jim Dwyer in the record, Mr. Chairman? Without objection, so ordered. Okay. I'd like to go down the uh, findings in the GAO report with which you disagree. The uh, gentlelady's time has expired. We will have another opportunity, but the gentlelady's time has expired. We are going to recess for the vote, which is in progress. I think it's the only vote of the day. Uh, so we will recess for about 10 minutes. I would just uh, point out uh, that uh, the gentlelady from New York has cited a number of uh, people who have been unemployed or put out of work, but the difference here is that none of them were put out of work, uh, or there was no suggestion that the First Lady had anything to do with their being put out of work. So I think that ought to be well, part Mr. of the record. Mr. Chairman, may I put this list in the record of, of uh, the findings of GAO, which are quite extensive, where they had no written policies or procedures, and it goes down specifically. Without objection. Just have a quick moment to, uh, with the entry, would you yes. also enter the cover letter from Pete Moore, which, which says that it is not an audit review or, or any... Uh, Without objection, that uh, the cover letter would be included with Thank the you. with the review. Mr. And Chairman, we will stand in recess for... Mr. Chairman, uh, with respect to the unanimous request, uh, yes. consent request from the gentleman from New York, I, w I would just say that I, I appreciate her efforts to to underline and, and point out to us the devastating job losses that have occurred under the Clinton administration. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think the, that was totally uncalled for. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. I must, remind, I must remind the audience that you are here as guests of the House of Representatives and expressions of support or opposition to any comments by members of the panel are not appropriate. And, the and not only that, Mr. Mr. Chairman. The committee, well, Yes, the that, gentlelady. Mr. Chairman, this is the third time that has happened, and it seems to me that if this continues, then I think that the room will have to be cleared of those who think that this is some kind of theater. I agree with the chair, gentle chairwoman. And, and Mr. Chairman, let's go down to the floor and go on a bill that will privatize the travel office, remove it from politics. Billy, you said in your opening statement that it was uh, filled with political problems. Other people have found political problems. Pete Morick finds problems. Let's just move it into the private sector and stop this uh, three, this circus on uh, I, partisan I, uh, attacks. I appreciate the, the gentlelady's plug for her bill, but I will now recess the committee for 10 minutes. The travel office until the Clinton administration decided to politicize it. Mr. Chairman, that was also uncalled for. And untrue. We'll continue with testimony from yesterday's travel office hearing in a moment. Get C-SPAN schedule information 24 hours a day by calling our schedule hotline at area code 202-628-2205. Our program schedules are also available online. You'll find information on America Online, the Internet, and the World Wide Web. You can watch for schedule information. At 15 and 45 minutes past each hour, check the bottom of your screen for updates. Also several times each day, listings of programs coming up over the next few hours. These on-screen updates normally air just before 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and at other times through the day. And the Preview Channel now provides our program schedule. If your local cable company carries the Preview Channel, you can check it throughout the day for updated C-SPAN schedule information. Now the White House Travel Office hearing. Members of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee returned from lunch to hear from former Travel Office Director Billy Ray Dale. This part of the event runs about two and a half hours. The uh, Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will resume sitting, and I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from New York, Chairman of the Post Office uh, Subcommittee, Mr. McHugh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I was saying before I left, no. Uh, during the course of today's testimony, we've heard a lot about how you gentlemen, if not universally, most of you felt that there would be changes made and how the Clinton administration would want your office to be run. Uh, I don't think any professional would, would see uh, anything unusual in that. Uh, I, I note that, that in the testimony presented by Mr. Wright, for example, 
Uh, you make the comment that no top level White House staffers of the Clintons ever came to our office to find out what we did, how we did it, or to advise any of us, give us instructions or changes they would want. Is that pretty much a universal perception? It seems to me, having spent a little time in government administration, that if you are concerned about the operation of any office, that you would take the time as a new presence in town to visit those areas of concern, to look at them firsthand. How about that? Did those people from the Clinton administration come down and, and examine your operations and try to find out some information for themselves prior to all of the other audits and non-audits that occurred? No, sir, if I may answer that, <clears throat> they did not, and we were not su successful in getting a meeting with them. Uh, if I may just state my own personal opinion, when the Clinton administration came in, there was almost an arrogance towards them, that they felt like that they had won the election and they didn't need anybody to tell them or advise them how to do things. Uh, forgetting your personal uh, observation, uh, Mr. Dale, which I appreciate, yeah. but I would defer or, or turn to the other members uh, on the panel here this morning. Was that your experience with respect to no one from the administration coming down and looking at your operation or talking to you about it? No one ever talked to me, sir. That's true. No one ever did. And it was one of the indications that I had that uh, in the past we had always worked so closely with the press office and the advance office and uh, there was no relationship whatsoever. And it was just sort of another indication to me that we weren't going to be in their plans. So. When uh, the administration uh, talks about concerns about improprieties, concerns about one thing or another, those concerns didn't come about from their personal investigation or their personal knowledge. Would you say that's true? That's true. In fact, I, on at least one occasion, I went over to the uh, West Wing and saw Bill Dale sitting outside of Dee Dee Meyer's office, leaning on the railing, trying to get in to see her, and he was never able to do it. I see. Let me, let me just comment. Uh, we've heard a lot today about a particular newspaper article, and, and no one likes to see people lose their jobs. And indeed, the headline suggests that uh, postal workers 113 were handed pink slips, and those are personal tragedies. And whenever there are changes in an administration or changes in a Congress or changes in a way a government is run, regrettably, very unfortunately, people lose their jobs. But to suggest that somehow these workers equate to what these people at this dais, at, at that podium, have experienced, I think, is, is ludicrous to a fault. Beyond that, if we read beyond the headlines, the article says some other interesting things that I haven't heard mentioned here today. It suggests very correctly that back in June, this Congress, through its oversight committee, the House Operations Committee, voted in public to privatize this post office. In no small measure because of the very regrettable outrages that occurred there under past majorities. And I won't recount those here. So these workers have known, as, as great as the tragedy of losing a job may be, that this day was coming because of the vote the House took and opened last June. Secondly, the article also noted that Pitney Bowes, who has won the contract, has offered job opportunities to some 90 of those 113 employees. Now, those positions may not be to the full liking of the employees in question. I understand that as well. But to just suggest here today, as has been, that somehow these workers are in a similar situation as these, I think, does no service to the, to the very important work of this committee. These people found themselves in this position for one reason. There was a political agenda that went bad. It was a political agenda that they tried to backfill, and at best, that was improper, unfair. Maybe, maybe at worst, illegal. But the using of federal agencies, from the FBI to possibly the IRS, as we've heard here today, and Mr. Chairman, I, I trust that we will pursue those very important questions further to justify a political action. That is not changing an administration. That is not politics as usual. That's a disgrace, and I commend the chairman for being here today, and I too, gentlemen, 
offer my apologies to you for whatever small part of this government I represent. You have been treated terribly, and I'm ashamed. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time, and I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from California, the chairman of the Government Management Subcommittee, Mr. Horn, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to commend you, since you started early on three years ago mm. trying to get the evidence on this particular situation. And the majority in charge of the Congress and this committee at that time simply stiffed you and told the people in the executive branch, don't cooperate. And we've never had much cooperation. So I commend you for getting before us the victims of this absurdity. Uh, what you went through, Mr. Dale, would be known in the Soviet Union when Stalin ruled supreme as a political show trial. It was ruthless. It was an abuse of federal power. And as you look at this, in my humble opinion, the apology should be coming from the president, the first lady, the White House staff involved. They ought to be ashamed of themselves. The United States attorney who permitted your indictment ought to be ashamed. The Attorney General of the United States, in whom a lot of us uh, have great trust uh, and has integrity, she ought to be reviewing that case as to how this happened and how that indictment went through. The misuse of the Federal Bureau of Investigation is an outrage. And Mr. McSweeney, I'm probably not as Irish as you are, but I'm half Irish. And that's just enough to get my dander up all morning. I've been suffering as I listen to this. And it's an outrage. And I'm also concerned that probably has any civil liberties group in the country offered to help any one of you? Can we just go down the line? Did you have the ACLU say, we think this is terrible and we want to protect your rights? No, sir. No. No, sir. No. No, sir. No. No, sir. No. 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 And no. Uh, they should be ashamed. They should be ashamed. And I must say, I have only heard silence out of any of them. And uh, they come and tell us all the great things they're doing. They ought to do some of the tough things, which is when people are victimized by the government they've served so loyally. What we have is a governmental cancer going on, hidden by a smile. And it disturbs me greatly. We seem to have Peter Pan floating around the White House, disappearing files one day, floating around again, dropping memos on tables where only the first family and a few Secret Service people are there. Uh, it boggles the mind. The chairman mentioned in introducing me that I chair one of the subcommittees, the one on uh, government management information and technology. Let me ask you, one of our recommendations is that the executive office of the president, the White House, ought to have an independent inspector general. That would have solved a lot of these problems. Someone that is there as a professional can go in and analyze a situation, conduct the appropriate management audit or financial audit. I've listened to my friends on the min minority side today do a lot of chatter about this being an audit. Anybody that's ever run an organization knows this wasn't an audit of finances. This was an audit of practices. And the blame for lack of computers and everything else could go over several administrations. Uh, I remember when President Bush went in there, he couldn't believe the lack of a communication system. The White House had not kept up with technology. Let me ask you, Mr. Dale, do you have any feelings on the value of an inspector general in the office of the president, the White House? I, I personally think that it would, yes. Any other opinions on that? Do you all think it might be helpful to have an independent official not beholden to the president who's there to make sure the public interest is done? I think it would have been helpful to have, to have anyone to turn to. The day that I walked out of that, uh, the new executive office building, I, uh, there was nowhere to turn, and the government was after me. Any other feelings? I can only agree with that. <clears throat> I think well, it, independent is the key word, not beholden to not Independent, the not beholden anybody. to any president, but serving or any all presidents, or just as you served all presidents, correct. regardless of party, regardless of the ideology. And one of the things that uh, I think <clears throat> over the years that many of us have been proud of in this government, when you look at the professionals in the Office of Management and Budget and the professionals in the White House, these truly were servants of the presidency, not a particular president, but getting the job done for whoever's president. I have an editorial here, Mr. Chairman, that's titled, Leave Billy Dale Alone. It 
It's by the Scripps Howard News Service. It appeared in the leading newspaper in my district, the Long Beach Press-Telegram, on January 12, 1996. I'd like it included in the record at this point. Without objection, so ordered. I want to read a couple of paragraphs here, because we've heard it discussed this morning. It said, uh, the co to cover up this ham-handed combination of arrogance and ineptitude, the White House accused Dale of embezzlement. When that case finally came to trial after two years, a jury quickly and completely vindicated Dale. Now comes Robert Bennett, a member of the Clinton's growing legal corps, who represents the president in the Paula Jones scrape, and also represents TV millionaire Harry Thomason, a close Clinton friend who was involved in the travel office firing. On national TV, Bennett said that Dale had been willing to plea bargain his way out of the trial, adding, in a sarcastic sneer, says Scripps Howard, quote, so let's not all cry about Billy Dale, unquote. And then the Scripps Howard goes on to say, so what? A phrase we heard this morning, uh, repeated from a phrase of the minority. Dale was looking at a choice between plea bargaining to a misdemeanor and paying a $69,000 fine or fighting the charges and paying $500,000 in legal bills. In the, and then the Scripps Howard goes on, in the lush green pastures where high-priced lawyers like Bennett graze, money is not a consideration. For jobless working people like the Dales, the family, it is. In this event, Dale fought and won. He is innocent, and whether he once considered a plea bargain now doesn't mean a damn thing, unquote, from Scripps Howard. And Mr. Chairman, I think that sort of sums it up. The American bar should be looking at lawyers that miscite and misquote the truth in these cases, be it on the West Coast or the East Coast. I think the American people have had enough. The gentleman's time has expired. I now please to recognize the uh, chairman of our civil service uh, subcommittee, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, for five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a couple of questions about uh, the firing. It's my understanding, uh, Mr. Dale, when you were called into Mr. Watkins and fired uh, or terminated, told you'd be out in two hours, that he, uh, he indicated that this was part of the National Performance Review, uh, this uh, change in personnel. I, I think that I've read some other statements where you or one of the others had said that they re recall Mr. Watkins uh, saying this. It, do you recall that? Well, I, I recall him telling us that we were being terminated as part of the president's commitment to reduce the White House staff by 25 percent, yes. And I think also the press secretary, D.D. Myers, also said, uh, mentioned the National Performance uh, Review as, uh, as one of the, the reasons. Is that correct? I think so, yes. Anybody from the vice president's office or National Performance Review ever been in your office? No, sir. Anyone aware of the National Performance Review? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Um, you all had prior civil service. Some of you had prior uh, full civil service uh, rights or experience, is that correct? Who, who had those from other agencies? Just maybe you could just tell me your name if you've, uh, for the record, you had? Yes, Bob Van Eimeren. And you I had did Billy Dale. My first government uh, job was with, at the White House. Yes, other than the military, mine was at the uh, White House also. Okay. And I had afterwards, when I took the job over the Defense Department. Anyone else? Uh, well, what concerns me, I chaired the House Civil Service uh, Subcommittee, and I think federal employees should have some rights, even if you work for the White House. Uh, and they had the right to, to, to dismiss you, as far as I can see, under the, the practices. What drives me absolutely crazy is the fact that they used, it appears, the FBI for cover, and then harassed uh, you, you and some of the others involved in this with the uh, IRS. Is that, I mean, did, uh, do you feel that you that there was a use of a law enforcement agency in this process, uh, Mr. Dale? Yes, sir, I do. And uh, others, uh, you feel the what they did uh, again? It, my my indication or my reading of this is 
On the 12th of May, they called in the FBI before Pete Marwick was uh, retained on the 13th. Uh, they also made statements, uh, as I recall, was it Mr. Kennedy that said, uh, if we don't have a response in 15 minutes, we'll have the IRS or some other agency. I'm paraphrasing him. Is that your reading and belief of this? Yes, sir. Yes, so they, it is. Uh, and also, if I might, might add, on the 20th of May, the president was asked, mm -hmm. this is the day after the firing, you know, what he knew about the firing. And he was very specific that he knew absolutely nothing and that he would refer all questions to his senior staff who were handling it. Well, I think it's offensive to hear from the other side any comparison between what they did with a federal law enforcement agency and then with the IRS uh, financial arm of the United States. I understand you all have, uh, or has everyone undergone some scrutiny by the IRS? Is that correct? Uh, if you haven't. I'm unaware of it. I mean, not I, aware I, I just it. assume that uh, during hang, this procedure we there. had. Yes. Yeah, I, I wasn't interviewed by the IRS, but the, I think mainly because I had a good attorney and he talked them out of it. Oh, I was interviewed by the IRS. Are but some of you currently still undergoing examination? Do, are you aware of it by IRS? I am. You are. I have no idea, although they did say not to be surprised if it happened, but I would have no way of knowing if it was happening. Now, the other thing that disturbs me in this whole process is there, were no, there was no NPR review. Was there anyone who indicated, I heard other members question before, was there, uh, and, and they ask you this question, had you had any indication that you were misperforming, there was mismanagement, there was financial misfeasance in that office, from January 20th to May, uh, to May 19th. Anyone aware of anything? No, there was no communications. Uh, no. no NPR review. So basically the whole thing is concocted. It looks to me like Mr. Thomason, I guess the administration had had nanny gate and they had problems from Waco and the president's $200 haircut. You, you guys ended up as the, as the uh, scapegoat. This was gonna be a, a fancy PR move. Did Mr. Thomason, when he came in, uh, he came in in February and tried to get business from you. Did he tell you he had an interest in that business? Well, or did it was Mr. Martins come in? It was Mr. Thomason's partner, Darnell Martins, who called me on the phone. To this day, I've never met either one of them. Did he disclose, did Darnell Martins disclose that uh, Thomason had an interest? No, sir. The only one that I can see that was bad-mouthing you was Thomason, and he was part of TRM who wanted some of this business, right? That's true. T was Thomason, R was Richland, M was Martin. Martins. So uh, they all had, he had an interest, and uh, I'm not sure if he's aware of, and I'm not sure what his status was later on, but if he was a special government employee, uh, he may in fact have violated the U.S. Code uh, 18205, which prohibits folks from getting uh, anything of benefit uh, uh, in return uh, it, uh, and, and having a position. You're aware of that? Yes, sir. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Blute, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to commend you for the uh, way that you've conducted these hearings over these months. Uh, you've been honest, you've been straightforward, and you've been seeking the truth in this matter. And you've run into a lot of um, blocks uh, and walls in, in your efforts to gain documents. And one of the reasons we're here today at this late date is that documents that this committee subpoenaed from the White House concerning this affair uh, did not show up until very, very recently. And as you know, uh, the Watkins memos tend to uh, be uh, different than what was said earlier by White House officials. So uh, I think it's important that we finally get to the bottom of this for the American people. Uh, I don't know and understand why uh, it was so difficult for the White House to just come clean and admit that this was a mistake, uh, that they intended to uh, change people there, which they had a legitimate uh, uh, legal authority to do. Uh, but instead, they didn't do that. They engaged in a deception. I said to Mr. Watkins, something that my mother used to tell the Blute kids, and that was, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And it seems to me that the White House engaged in deception from the very beginning as to why you were all uh, fired. And then after it was fairly revealed that uh, there was a mistake there, uh, they engaged in deception to try to prevent the real story 
from coming out. And the Watkins memo is very clear on that, and many, many other memos. And I think there are serious questions here that this committee and that the American people deserve to find the answers about. And I'm somewhat troubled by some of our colleagues in the minority side who seem to think that this is no big deal. Uh, the inappropriate use of the FBI and the IRS is no big deal. Uh, White House officials not being forthcoming to congressional investigators, to GAO investigators, this is no big deal to them. I think it's a very big deal, and it really cuts to uh, democracy as to how each branch can keep an eye on the other branch. If they had handled this the right way, the White House, this would now be a long forgotten personnel move. It might have been a tough move, it might have been a political move, but it would be long forgotten. But instead, uh, they went another way, and I think it's very clear what has happened here. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, all of you, but particularly Mr. Dale, because I think you have the longest tenure uh, in the travel office. Is that correct? Um, I think I have a, about two weeks longer than Mr. Wright. Okay, so we have some uh, long-term experience here, and you've been through many transitions where new administrations uh, have come into office. Uh, and I just want to ask you, that whenever a, another, other new administrations came into office, did you ever feel any uh, sense that your office was being sized up as a target of opportunity for the new administration's political cronies? Did you ever feel that in any other transition? There had been a couple of times that we had other political staff that thought they wanted to work in our office until they found out what a headache and what hard work it was, and then they thought they wanted to go someplace else in the government. So it never went anywhere? No. When you met with Mr. Watkins the day he informed you that Catherine Cornelius was going to come into, into your office, uh, I want you to elaborate on what was his rationale? Did he mention to you that she was a presidential cousin? Uh, how did he justify this, this move? Well, we had been aware all along that Catherine Cornelius had an interest of working in the travel office. But when he called me over, he told me that she was acting as a receptionist in his outer office and that she was unhappy and that she thought that she might want to go into the travel business once she left the White House and asked me if I would be willing to take her aboard and teach her the travel business because she had never worked in it before. And I told him, sure. And I asked him, how do I treat her? And he said, you treat her just like any of the other employees. She does the same duties that they do. So you had the impression that she was a relatively young woman who uh, was politically connected, but that's OK, mm -hmm. was going to, uh, you were going to uh, impart upon her the experience of your office. And as it turned out, it was something quite different. Right. Uh, she was working with Mr. Thomason and with others in the White House to somehow make a case uh, against uh, the travel office employees. I want to ask you this question, because you mentioned that, uh, and you did it vaguely, but I want you to clarify it. Uh, there were missing documents from your records uh, that the GAO and other reviewers, the Pete Marwick reviewers, uh, couldn't get access to. And this caused them to write some things that perhaps were not uh, absolutely accurate. But you've indicated that perhaps you think that maybe those documents were taken? I have no other reason to think otherwise, because <clears throat> before Catherine Cornelius came into that office, I prided myself on the fact that I could put my hands on any record that I was questioned about within 10 to 15 minutes. And then uh, you can't explain but, where those documents were. Well, the first two weeks that Catherine Cornelius worked in my office, I was on sick leave. And I found out after two weeks com coming back that she had been rummaging through the files. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think it's very clear what, what happened here. Even on Inauguration Day, as you have testified, uh, you were receiving calls uh, about the new travel office director, Catherine Cornelius, asking for her. Is that correct? That's correct. And yet later on, the White House officials said she just wanted to learn. And then uh, all around you, there were little signals that you were getting, the flowers that were then taken back and various other signals that a political offensive had started, uh, that your office was a target of opportunity uh, for the new administration uh, to put their people in, which in and of itself, once again, is not wrong. But to bring the FBI in, the, the IRS, and to try to frame up what obviously are decent, hardworking public servants is wrong. And I think this committee uh, thanks you very much for your testimony. Gentlemen's time has expired. I'm now pleased to recognize the chairman of our District of Columbia, 
subcommittee, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, let me just say that uh, I'm not sure that firing you, I think it would have been wrong. It would have been legal, but I think it would have been wrong. We have people, uh, civil servants, who have been doing a good job and move in. Patrick, we try to move away from those politics the old days, and I think it would have been wrong, but it would have been perfectly legal, and I think that's the, that's the point that Mr. Blute was trying uh, to make. Uh, once again, uh, uh, the, the way that this was handled, trashing innocent people's uh, reputation, spreading lies and rumors and so on, has I think escalated this uh, in the, in the cover-up uh, to where we are today. I want to just ask a, a few questions. Uh, Mr. Dale, in early February, Darnell Martins, a partner of Harry Thomason, called you uh, to seek business, didn't he? Yes, he did. <clears throat> uh, was there any doubt in your mind that he was seeking business for his company, TRM? No, sir, because I had asked him what was in it for him, and he told me the financial gain and he would realize. Did he tell you who else was involved in the uh, uh, partnership with him? No, sir, I didn't, I didn't know who he was or any connection he might have with the White House. Did he say anything about he was just checking this out for other people? Uh, I don't remember that he did. He just indicated that he was looking for business. Okay. And did you know at the time who Darnell Martins or Harry Thomason were? No, sir. Um, when did you learn that they were friends of the president? After we were fired and I read about it in the newspaper. If you had known that they were friends of the president, would you have thrown business their way or acted in any way differently? No, sir, I would not. Mr. Martin says he was upset that you couldn't give him an opportunity to get the business. Uh, <clears throat> can you explain why it wasn't feasible to prov provide him with a business? Because if Mr. Martin had gotten business, the charter companies would have had to pay him a commission, approximately 10 percent. And I told him that I didn't see where that, that would be financially beneficial to the White House press corps. And besides, I didn't need a middleman to handle the contacts at the airlines for me. Would have been an extra cost, in other words. An extra cost, yes. Did you uh, ever have any inquiries from anyone at the White House about why Dar Darnell Martins couldn't get the business? No, sir. Okay. Um, and at the time, you didn't know that TRM, the company owned by Dar Darnell Martins and Harry Thomason, were also seeking GSA contracts? No, sir, I did not. All right. Prior to your firing, uh, how often had you met with uh, Patsy Thomason or David Watkins? I had never met Patsy Thomason until May the 14th, the morning she walked into my office with the Pete Marwick people. Okay, how about uh, David Watkins? The one time that I met with him was uh, when he called me over to tell me that Catherine wanted to work in my office. And he never? I, I had met him in the hall in an unofficial capacity, shook hands with him and introduced myself, but no official meetings. He never expressed any concern about the quality of your work or or any, any rumors he'd heard or anything else? No, sir. Um, Mr. Dale, you testified that you tried on numerous occasions to meet with George Stephanopoulos and D.D. Myers and could not. Uh, what would you ordinarily have done in interacting with their office? Well, when we leave Washington with the president on a presidential trip, we consider the press secretary to be our supervisor. We work for them. What financial management concerns did Patsy Thomas and her David uh, Watkins raise with any of you? Any of you? Any of you raise any concerns, Steve? None. 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 So you're out trashing in the press and they never had raised any questions about you, given any rebuttal or anything else? No. No, sir. Did anyone ever raise the issue of financial mismanagement or concerns about this with you? Anyone at all? Or did anyone ever ask you for any accounting or explanation about uh, how or why you did what you did? No, sir. Um, can you describe the management or direction provided to your office uh, from Ms. Thomason or Mr. Watkins? We had none. Now, Mr. Van uh, Emmeren, uh, Harry Thomason, told uh, First uh, Lady Hillary uh, Rodham Clinton that he could have a better, uh, uh, cheaper operation up and running in an hour in the White House Travel Office. Do you find this to be the case after you return from the May 19th uh, 1993 meeting in which the entire White House Travel Office staff was fired. Mr. Davis, when I returned to the office, it was probably about 15 minutes. The, uh, the meeting with Mr. Watkins was about 15 minutes. Uh, and walking back into the office, and there are other people sitting at our desk, but they really had no clue uh, as to what to do. And one of the uh, uh, worldwide travel personnel sitting at my desk started asking me questions. How do you do this? How do you do that? And I just simply stated to her, I'm sorry, but I'm not in the mood to uh, tell you how to do my job right now. Did you have any contact with them uh, afterwards? No, I did not. Okay. Incredible. 
Well, let me just ask, Mr. Chairman, I understand um, that we have just received over 5,000 more pages of documents, which include many documents related to Mr. Uh, Harry Thomason that we have only now received because we issued subpoenas for these documents uh, uh, that have been evidently long withheld. We still have much more to learn about Mr. Thomason's uh, uh, role in this. And uh, with that, I would yield back and, and only say to these uh, gentlemen, I, I saw you on Larry King, and uh, I represented a lot of federal employees. And, my opinion, the rhetoric is great, but uh, when you trash people who have given their careers to government like this, it is, it is the wrong message. You were wrongly treated, and uh, I, it, is, it is regrettable. And I hope that this story, as it echoes out across this country, uh, uh, will clear once and for all the, the mysteries that surrounded this and the, allega the false allegations that came forward. Thank you. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time, and thank him for his questioning. And now I'm going to yield five minutes to the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Gutnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't uh, intend to take my full uh, five minutes, but Mr. Dale, we have had uh, written testimony, uh, I'm sorry, documented and written and oral testimony under oath in this committee that documents were destroyed, computer files were erased. And I was curious, did any of that affect your ability to defend yourself? Were any of those files uh, that were ultimately found to be missing or, or that we know now that have been destroyed, did that affect your ability to defend yourself? Well. At first, we thought it would, but as it turned out, it didn't. But we were very limited in what we could introduce in court as far as White House documents. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I just, uh, and I think they've, they've been uh, more than willing uh, uh, testifiers here today, and so I don't want to go too long, but I just want to say that if, and I, maybe I should ask, which of the three actually uh, had to attend their father's funeral uh, still being sullied? I can't imagine anything worse. I mean, and, and this, is a, this is an administration who came into office saying, I feel your pain. I cannot imagine anything more reprehensible than that. And then I, I understand that one of you, and I can't remember which one, uh, got a call from your daughter to say something to the effect, say it isn't true, Dad. Exactly. Yes, sir. That's hard to take. I, I, as a, a father of two daughters, I could not imagine. Now, when we file for public office, and in fact, we... Uh, say that we can be uh, called almost anything in the book and, this, and it's all legal and we don't have any real recourse. Now obviously you do have ultimately some recourse, uh, perhaps through a civil suit. I'm not an attorney and I'm not going to give you any advice, but <coughs> it seems to me that you've got awfully strong grounds and uh, uh, this would be a very fertile field to have a case tried in, in D.C. where you have an awful lot of federal employees. But let me just say, I, I also have to just say, I'm amazed at how calm you are. Because it seems to me that uh, if it were me, I would have an anger and a rage burning inside me. I would be like a volcano. Because I cannot believe what you folks have been through over the last several years. And uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, we have Chairman Klinger, who is probably among the most moderate, nonpartisan members of this conference, who I think finally has begun to uh, uh, exhibit some of the rage that we're beginning to feel about the activities that have taken place over the last several years. Uh, I did not know until... Uh, uh, my colleague, Mr. Davis, just announced there are now even more documents finally coming forward, documents that we have requested uh, for over a year. And, it, and, it, and this, this, this sort of drip, drip, drip of new information, new documents, new testimony, it seems to me it's, uh, it, it's unbelievable. But there's one word, and we've heard from the other side, and we've heard from the administration, we've heard from some of their lawyers, we've heard lots of legalisms, we've heard half-handed excuses, uh, but you know, the real word is moral. I mean, there is something, I don't know what obstruction of justice really is. And I don't know if we have a legal definition of abuse of power. But I know this, this is wrong. It is morally wrong what they did to you uh, for their own political uh, reasons. And it seems to me we do have some... Thank you all for coming here today. We appreciate uh, what you've been through, and we're going to do everything we can to make it right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. I'm now pleased to yield to the gentleman from Ohio, uh, Mr. La Tourette, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of observations that I'd like to make uh, beginning. Um, Mr. Dale in particular, I, uh, I was very much looking forward to your uh, coming here today because I've had a lot of characterizations of you and seen a lot of characterizations of you in the press. Uh, and I, I, I would say... Uh, <clears throat> this side of the aisle and Sam Donaldson don't agree all the time, but I would suggest to you that uh, I would agree with this observation that you seem to be very candid and a straight shooter. 
Um, and I hope you take this the right way, but you don't strike me as a, a big schemer or someone who was developing an elaborate plan to uh, uh, defraud the press corps. Uh, as a matter of fact, all seven of you just seem like uh, people who have worked between nine and 29 years at uh, the White House Travel Office trying to do your jobs and provide the best service you could to the press corps, the White House press corps, and also the president that you, uh, you served. And unlike uh, some other people in this town that may deserve an Appalachian Slick, I don't think anyone will call you Slick Billy by the time we're done with this, this set of hearings. And Mr. McSweeney, I, uh, uh, although I'm new, uh, the freshmen have become somewhat battle-hardened during this uh, 104th Congress, but I, I was particularly moved by your statements earlier today as you talked about the rage that you felt for the last uh, two years. I don't blame you. Uh, I felt it as you spoke and talked about Mr. Dale's daughters and the wedding plans. Uh, and I don't how, know how uh, the seven of you lived with it or, or how you get past it. Um, and as I sit here today, I used to be a, a prosecutor, and I know I met Mr. Dale during the break, and when I found out I was a prosecutor, I sort of backed up a little bit because he hasn't had good experiences with prosecutors recently. But um, <laughs> I have to tell you, none of you sounded rehearsed. Uh, you don't sound coached. Uh, you don't have lawyers whispering into your ears and, and providing you with answers. Uh, and you haven't issued a single lawyerly non-denial <laughs> That's really a denial by the time we, we get through all the fancy words that are spoken. Uh, and uh, in giving your testimony today, you haven't shut down the C-SPAN and the network cameras, and you've let America uh, hear what it is you have to say, and I appreciate that. You weren't here for the first two hearings, but I just uh, want to go back in chronology. The first hearing um, sort of had a theme that because you, Mr. Dale, were under indictment that uh, the chairman and the majority of this committee was all wet, and why are you looking into this thing for? As a matter of fact, I remember one point during that first hearing where the chairman was chastised for, uh, apparently he'd sent a letter <clears throat> that indicated that some exculpatory material had been found. And for those of you who aren't lawyers, exculpatory material means that information that the government has in its possession that shows a person charged with a crime isn't guilty. Uh, and there were some on the, uh, the other side of the panel who were sort of suggesting what a horrible thing to do to provide to a, a person charged with a crime uh, documents in the possession of the government that would tend to show that they weren't guilty of that crime. Uh, and I thought that was strange, given my, uh, my background. The second hearing we had, uh, you had been acquitted, uh, and we were faced with so what. But, you know, even though you'd been acquitted, we were told the fact that a grand jury had indicted you still made you somehow uh, a bad person, and we should be looking at that. In today's hearing, we've sort of heard that, well, okay, uh, you've been indicted, you've been acquitted. And I think Mr. Davis made the observation, and all of us that are, used to be prosecutors, I think Mr. Davis used the example of a prosecutor being able to indict a ham sandwich. That's the expression we have in the... <laughs> in the, in the uh, prosecutorial business, but now there's this plea agreement. And, and, and so that, that's being trotted out at the third hearing and, and in the time since we've had our other hearing. And I, uh, it's incomprehensible to me that if the government has documents in its possession uh, that tend to show that a person charged with a crime is not guilty of that crime, and they won't release those documents uh, to let a person defend themselves, uh, I, I, uh, I think almost everybody would be in the position that you found yourself in uh, as you attempted to defend yourself. And so I, I'm sorry that that's the way the justice system has unraveled for you. I, I want to uh, just follow up on a couple of observations that were made by, uh, by some of my colleagues. And going back to Mrs. Cornelius, who I believe is the third cousin of the President of the United States, uh, I, I think in response to Mr. McHugh's question, you, you said that Mr. Watkins, Watkins asked you to teach her the travel business. Is that right? That's right. And, and uh, uh, from the documents that I reviewed, I think in order to teach her the travel business, because she was going to be a new employee coming into an office staffed with gentlemen who had been there between 9 and 29 years. It, you determined, or didn't you suggest, that she go to Dallas to take a course to learn the computer system that you used in the travel office? Yes, sir, I did. As a matter of fact, I already had the arrangements made, and she was scheduled to go on uh, Monday morning, May the 17th. But Mrs. Cornelius, the third cousin of the president, didn't go to Dallas to learn the computer system, did she? No, she did not. And, and why is that, do you know? I, I don't know. I think that she thought that she was going to be taken over the office and that she would leave the computer operations to the other people. When, when you were asked to teach her the travel business, were you aware at that time that she had authored a memo the previous December uh, talking about how she could come in and run your, the travel office? No, sir. I, I didn't come into possession of that until just two or three or four days before we were fired. You're aware as you sit here today that, that part of the brouhaha that, that uh, eventually consumed you all on May the 19th were based upon allegations that Mrs. Cornelius was making to others in the administration, are you not? 
Yes, sir, I am. And, and I think you mentioned in your opening remarks that, uh, that I forget, you, you put it rather well and it was rather polite that somehow she was indicating that you had acquired uh, possessions that she didn't think federal employees could have, like lake homes and things of that nature. Is that your understanding? That's right, but she didn't take into consideration that that lake home was mortgaged. Oh, that's right. I, are you the one that owns the lake home? Yes, I am. Did, did you steal any money from the press corps, the citizens of the United States, to buy that lake home? No, sir. Did, did anyone at the White House have the courtesy to come down and ask you when you acquired it, how you acquired it, what the mortgage was? No, sir. And, and for any of the rest of you gentlemen that have the, the nerve as federal employees to own anything, were you ever interviewed by anybody at the White House and asked how it is you, you came into you, you worked hard for it. Did anybody ask you? How you came in possession of those uh, things? No, sir. No. Um, okay. Thanks very much. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Martini, for five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Uh, forgive me. I should recognize on the minority side the gentleman, my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Mr. Ken Jorsky, for five minutes. I'm learning every day what it's like to be in the minority. <laughs> uh, First of all, I'll give you a report, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I haven't been able to attend these hearings. As you know, the Commonwealth suffered a billion-dollar damage, and part was in your district, and I can assure you that we just had a meeting with the Lieutenant Governor and the delegation, and we're moving along, proceeding well, in a very bipartisan way to help our mutual constituents. Uh, if I may, I'm, I was a little disturbed in prior testimony before this committee on this whole effect, because I, I guess coming from a legal background, Myself, I have a great deal of respect uh, for the process, the legal process. And, and, uh, and this is, of course, uh, directed to you, uh, uh, Ms. Dale. Uh, it is not normal that a governor or a president would have some impact on what a district attorney or what a, a U.S. attorney does in a legal matter. And then it, it, there's less likelihood that that individual will have an impact on what a grand jury of citizens do when they are given sworn testimony. And in this case, as I understand it, the normal process, the standard procedure of the criminal prosecution by the public integrity section of the Justice Department was followed in all regards. And there are a multiplicity of steps that they have gone through. And, and they follow those steps. And as a result, as I understand it, uh, ultimately an investigation having been had, the, the evidence of that investigation have been taken to a grand jury and powered over more than 15 months, did in fact return an indictment against you. And uh, after a hearing of several weeks, a jury did uh, finally closet itself and come back, and with, I think within two hours, and find you not guilty. And uh, that is the normal process. Do you have anything that leads you to believe that there was an obstruction of justice or an abuse of justice here by anyone in the Justice Department, the FBI, or on that grand jury or that jury or the trial judge in this case? <clears throat> no, sir. I have no proof of that, and I would hesitate to, to accuse anybody of that. I didn't ask you whether you approved. Do you have any, any indication of that or any inclination or any suggestion of that? Well, I have to ask myself how the FBI got involved in this. Okay. I have to ask myself, I've been told that a case... The FBI got involved, and I know that that is something that's open as to how that happened. I'm not talking about the initial call to the White House by the FBI. We've had testimony on that. The testimony was when they found out something was awry, they didn't quite know what to do because none of them had been in office more than 120 days and had never run across the situation. And quite frankly, I'm not sure they did the right thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the process after it moved out of the White House, when it was referred to the Justice Department and the, the public integrity section of the Justice Department. Are you suggesting in any way that either those attorneys in the Justice Department people in the grand jury, the, the judge that tried the case, or the people that made up the jury were in some way compromised? Absolutely not, because I would... Well, I, I, I will yield if we have an agreement, you know, that I get the time back and you don't... Yes. It's my understanding that the White House withheld documents from uh, the uh, public uh, 
public integrity sec section, no, which would no. have had a bearing on possibly no. even having an indictment. Okay. As, I, as I understand, we call him my time, as I understand it, I'm not familiar with that case, it is Mr. Dale's contention that was, there was some log that he did not have that, that he then, therefore, was asking for and was not available or not knowing, not knowing. But what, what the gentleman yield further, he didn't even have his own petty cash records. They were kept from him, so things that he could have used before the grand jury to prevent an indictment was Absolutely. kept from him by the White House. I, I understand. Well, I understand that, but also I understand that in the report of Pete Merrick, the accounting firm, that clearly you, you, it's a very responsible firm. Don't you agree with that? Uh, depending on what you want them to do, yes. Uh, well, they, they said there was gross mismanagement there. I mean, their conclusion. Show me, show me in their report where it says that. The uh, yield that there's no, nowhere in that report does it talk about gross mismanagement. Then you can show us where it says that. <clears throat> you know, I don't know. Let me, let me say, we won't say, I, I, I shouldn't be quoted that way. Serious financial management weaknesses existed. Fence? I, if, if, no, that is the, if that is the case? No, but I, what, what I'm concluding that from that, I'm not sure. I'm not uh, castigating you, and I'm not castigating the White House. I'm trying to figure out if, as a member of Congress, I walk into my office, or my wife walks into my office, and she gets a call from a very responsible friend of ours that's in business, a banker, a lawyer, someone who has no reason to uh, mis misinform me of something, and he tells her that there's mismanagement in my office. Funds are being mismanaged. Aren't, aren't they expected to take some sort of action? I would expect them. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I'd, I'd expect her to inform my chief of staff immediately. I'd expect her to inform me immediately. And not having dealt with this, I would probably call the FBI or call someone and say, what is this, knowing full well these are my funds, these are federal funds, or at least funds that no, sir, federal officials are responsible for. You are wrong. There were no federal funds involved. That are federal officials are responsible for. Okay. If those funds were embezzled, it would be the obligation of the United States government to make that trust fund whole. So to that extent, we were the full faith and credit underwriters of the funds you held. No, sir, you were not. The United States government did not make up the $40,000 when UPI filed bankruptcy. I had to make it up. The United well, States government... Of course you have to make it up. We're going to go to any responsible party. But let me ask you on that question you had to make up, if I may indulge the committee for another two minutes since I uh, was uh, convenient in yielding. We, ha we do have other members. I will indulge the gentleman for one more question. Uh, I if the case you had to make it up, it's very simple. It seems to me it answers something. Why didn't you contest the fact that you're not responsible and not have to make it up? And go and have that issue litigated in the court of civil law. And unless they can prove you're responsible, you don't have to make it up. Well, I didn't have that option. I well, I understand. I Mr. I'm not putting you on. I understand the cost you went through. I understand the embarrassment, all those things. I'm just saying, do you feel that we ought to go on with this here and really go in to find out and call these prosecutors in and call that grand jury in? And, and determine whether or not there, there's something here that we're not aware of, or was this something that happened that wasn't perhaps handled in the best way, but Gentlemen, there's no maliciousness to it? Time has oh, started. no, sir, I would not agree with that. And I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Martini, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just follow up on the question, Mr. Dale, that was asked of you by my colleague from Pennsylvania, which really is asking you to try to bifurcate uh, a, a process, and it's, uh, in my opinion, uh, inherently unfair uh, to try to suggest that for you, in your own mind, to divide where along in this process there may have been inappropriate uh, uh, legal actions in investigating uh, this matter. And quite frankly, um, my colleague has a legal background, as I do, as others here on this panel do, and the inherent unfairness in, in that is those of us who had experience in this area know that uh, a, a matter can be tainted from wrongdoing right in the beginning, and that taint remains in the case, and the Justice Department and the courts uh, may never know about the wrongdoing in the initial stages of the investigation, such as the, the loss of documents and the secretion of other evidence, et cetera. So, so to frame the question like that uh, has done you, I think, uh, an injustice, and I just wanted to comment uh, on that point. Um, 
I'd like to just use my time to share with you some of my thoughts on this as a new member of this committee and new member of Congress. First of all, uh, many people have come up to me uh, as we've had hearings and have asked me, uh, and I've heard from my colleagues, efforts to minimize the significance of these hearings, particularly in the beginning, uh, particularly when we began this process some months ago. And to the credit of our chairman and, and his uh, willingness to go forward on these committees, I think we now see a much different light, and particularly the American people today have had the benefit of actually seeing why these committees are so, these hearings were so important. They've had the chance to listen to the testimony of live people, uh, people whose, whose lives have been dramatically impacted in a very negative way uh, by the mishandling of your termination and firing, uh, people whose families have been impacted and financially and emotionally. So I'm hopeful that uh, uh, the American people and the people following these hearings now know why it was so important for Congress uh, to undertake uh, finding out and hearing from you as well uh, what did happen in the firings back on May 19, uh, 1993. And I, I don't think there's any position anymore to attempt to minimize the importance of these hearings because if out of these hearings we are successful in, in the future, uh, standing between the abuses of powers and the wrongful firings and mistreatments and using public employees as uh, pawns and using your integrity and your character and your many years of service uh, to the uh, United States government uh, to be used only as pawns in a failed political media plan, and that's what this was in my opinion. This was an assessment by the White House that if they had just terminated you for no cause, they would have sustained some negative publicity uh, for that, and, uh, but, the, but they had the right to do that. They chose instead uh, to try to avoid that and spin it the best way, and I think unfortunately we're seeing more political spin in this governing process uh, uh, than, than I like to see in my first year here. Uh, but now, when a political spin impacts on people's lives, we do have a very major role in standing up and, and getting to the bottom of this. Um, it's interesting, having sat here a week ago and listened uh, to Mr. Hot Watkins, and it's interesting also, even as recently as last week, our First Lady is still insisting that she had no role other than she was concerned, but she did not order the firing. And I go back to Mr. Watkins initially, in the initial memo uh, by the White House undertaken to look into this issue, uh, most of the blame seemed to have been placed on Mr. Watkins and his handling of this. And it was a noticeable absence of any of the conversations with, uh, with the First Lady or with Mr. Thomason and, or anyone else. And one has to ask, in my opinion, and the American people have to ask, if there was nothing wrong in the handling of this, uh, of this matter, in the manner in which you were fired, then why is it that everybody is trying to distance themselves from the actual responsibility of firing you? Why is it that Mr. Watkins uh, took the time after the fact to write this soul-searching memo to say he was going to straighten out the reference, the, uh, the, the record, uh, and clearly did straighten out the record, in my opinion, having heard his testimony and having read that memo, uh, he certainly does in that uh, memo uh, clearly uh, place the responsibility for these firings back into the Oval Office through the, through the First Lady, in my opinion. So that's a question that I think should be raised by everyone who tries to minimize these hearings. If there was nothing wrong, and if it was such a minimal matter as we hear on the other side constantly, then why is it that no one has stepped forward and clearly said, this was my responsibility? Uh, they've shifted it back and forth, and they're continuing to shift it back and forth. And I'm satisfied they know uh, that the evidence is there now that the manner in which you were treated uh, was, uh, was, uh, was inappropriate, was malicious, uh, and really uh, was a misjudgment on their part uh, to try to gain some political spin. And let me just close by saying what I said last week, but I think it's worth saying. Anyone who read uh, the Watkins memo last week uh, and I invite anyone in the American public to do so, and anyone who listened to his testimony would clearly come away from the plain meaning of those words, uh, where the authority was and the decision was, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, when someone says there was pressure, all hell would break out, uh, uses that type of terminology throughout that memo, he did not have the free will to exercise this decision on his own. And he knew very well that the decision had to be made, had to be made quickly to fill those slots with their people. And you, unfortunately, have been the victim, in my opinion, of a very malicious act, at the very least, putting it, uh, putting it mildly. So uh, let me close by saying on behalf of 
uh, the American people and for those that we can speak on behalf of, we certainly do apologize for the travail that you've been put through and the ordeal that you and your families have been put through. And I say that sincerely and thank you for being here on this very long day. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thank uh, the gentleman. And I'm now pleased to yield to the other gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Chicago, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me uh, say that I was uh, very happy to be here for the opening statement and here. Uh, I think it's Mr. McCaffrey. I'm not sure. Say that for that if there were other public employees who were treated in this manner that he felt for them. Um, because it's interesting that even though uh, you're being almost used as, as props, uh, that this Congress has not treated long-term, nonpartisan employees well. But let's move to your instant case. I would hope that after we have now discovered that you have uh, been put in this situation, that there would be more done about providing some assistance um, than just for us to hold a hearing. That if, in fact, um, the committee determines through the evidence that, you know, these expenditures of your private funds for legal fees were, in, were unnecessary because of the way that this was mishandled, that perhaps something could be done to alleviate you of that burden. It is interesting also that I think at the crux of this, if something was done wrong, we're really talking about the FBI and the Justice Department proceeding with an investigation that should not have been proceeded with. The committee, at least from the comments I've heard, members want to keep talking about the White House. If something was really done wrong here, it's with the law enforcement officials who proceeded with the suggestion that there was less than adequate evidence uh, to proceed with a criminal indictment. And I want to join in with the uh, comments of my colleague from Pennsylvania that if that's really the allegation, that we need to stop chasing this, um, this attack on Hillary Clinton and really focus in on whether or not we have law enforcement officials who, for whatever purpose, would take someone who innocently may have mishandled some things in a management sense and then try to turn that into a criminal matter. And so uh, I would hope that if people are seriously and sincerely concerned that we would do something about your personal situations, number one, and secondly, that we would get to the heart of what should be the real concern uh, of this committee. And I'd like to yield whatever other time I have uh, to uh, either Congresswoman Maloney, if she'd like it, or, or my colleague from Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I uh, would like to be associated with my colleague's comments and his concern, not just for these seven federal employees, but the many federal employees that were furloughed and did not receive paychecks. I understand you, you received paychecks, but they did not receive paychecks during that furloughed time. And to my very good friend and colleague from uh, New Jersey, I, I just would like to take issue with one comment that you said that we are treating this as a, as a minimal matter. Uh, the minority is treating it very seriously, and in fact, we've come forward with several uh, proposals uh, to improve the management of the, of the uh, White House Travel Office. And in fact, uh, 27 of the suggested improvements have already been implemented by the White House that were made by GAO. The, the um, auditing firm, Pete Marwick, in their management review, which was later reviewed by the GAO, listed a, a number of weaknesses that still remain in the, in the travel office. And I'd like to go through them. Um, during your, your period, uh, Mr. Dale, and, and they said that, that written policies and procedures, none, none existed. Segregated duties, lines of authority, clearly communicated, none. Periodic audits, none. Oversight and guidance, none. Procurement of goods and services, customers' needs determined, none. Goods and services acquired competitively, none. I thought that was a requirement in federal government, that everything be competitively bid, but they found that nothing was competitively bid. Documented agreements, please, may I go through this list? Documented agreements or written contracts. None, no written contracts. System to identify and record all costs. None. Again, this is a finding by an independent body, not a Republican, not a Democrat, but an independent body systems to provide accurate data for billing, none. Then it goes into billing practices. 
Billings prepared timely. Some procedures were in place. System to maintain history of billings and receipts, none. Under cash payment, vouchers reviewed and approved before payment. GAO and Pete Marwick found none. Receipts deposited on the day received or next business day, none. Under financial reporting, it says transactions accurately recorded and disclosed in financial reports, none. General ledger to classify, summarize, and report financial data, none. Systems for reports, none. Report on financial position, none. Report on operations, none. Report on cash flows, none. Uh, they held that uh, there was tremendous mismanagement. Now, I have a question for Mr. McSweeney. Can I have a chance to answer those? I, I asked you. Yes, you have a chance to answer. I dispute each and every one of them. How do you get approval to, for a cash expenditure when you're standing on an isolated spot at a runway in a foreign country at 3 o'clock in the morning and you're told that it's going to cost you $2,500 to load an airplane? Who do you call? Put yourself in my shoes. That's all I ask you, you to you do. You just said there were no records. Now, if you'd like that to... That is absolutely false. I would like you to respond in writing to all of the allegations put forward, not by me, not by the Democrats, not by the Republicans, but by an independent body. I request very respectfully uh, that you put in writing why none of these management suggestions or management, I, I would call this general accounting procedures, general management procedures, uh, why none of them were put into a formalized uh, management. Uh, Go right up and down the line here and ask these gentlemen if those procedures were in existence. That lady's time has expired. Mr. Chairman, if I could I, just say, add one to you, sir, because I know what you really care about is getting the travel office running better. If uh, we could ask each of them to reply in writing to each of, 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 the, of the findings, again, by an independent auditing firm and by the general accounting office, um, I, I do believe that we should spend time in trying to figure out how to better run this office. And again, I truly believe Mr. Chairman, if you were interested in good management, we would simply um, outsource this office and have it, uh, and I have legislation to achieve that, and then let us go forward with other hearings on how we can uh, provide more American jobs, the economy, Medicaid, Medicare. The gentlelady's time has expired, but uh, Mr. McSweeney wanted to respond uh, also to this. I wanted questions. to make one point. You're asking for us to answer those when we do not have management authority, five out of the seven here, uh, and I don't quite understand what you're talking about. Well, uh, these were the findings in, in the... No, I mean, the, the report that you're asking us to present to you in writing, five out of the seven of us have no management or financial responsibilities at all, so... Uh, Mr. McSweeney, you raised a very good point. I was merely respond, responding to the gentleman who has the management authority who said that all of you would agree with his position Earlier he said that, and so I was assuming that he meant that you then probably had management authority. No. Then maybe I, I would like to clarify it, Mr. Chairman, that only those who had management authority respond in writing to the findings of the independent audit. We will request and, if and that, that can be done, and, and they will do so. Um, that may, if I may suggest, I've listened to this exchange with interest. The individuals we're asking to reply to the gentlewoman from New York's questions do not have the records that have in some cases been destroyed in some from what we understand certainly were not taken out of the White House travel office when they all left they would have seen each other lugging lots of records nobody saw that I think it's harassment to ask them to reply in writing and I would prefer Mr. Chairman that we extend the round We'll get the questions asked. We are going to do just that. And Mr. let's have those Warren. answers. And I would say to the gentlewoman from New York, anybody that's ever run an organization, and I've run a university for 18 years, you have auditors all the time. What do they look at? They say, is there a written series of uh, processes and systems for an office? Then the question is, did a particular office follow those written systems and authorizations? 
this is not an indictable offense. When you do not follow them, you simply have auditors that say, here were your systems and here were your processes. Did you follow them? The fact is, in small groups like this group, it's often done without written uh, in the private industry as well as public. Point of personal Thank the gentleman. Point the gen point the gentle lady will state her point of personal privilege. Point, point of personal privilege only because my, my name was raised and, um, and an inaccurate statement was made. I was not asking for the files or the records. I was merely responding to what Pete Marwick listed as management policies. And for example, as one of their management policies, they said that it was standard operating you have procedure made, you have made those, not to those competitively points. bid contracts. The gentle lady, is, okay. time has expired, and uh, we are now going to move to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fox, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the chairman uh, holding these hearings. I believe it's very important that uh, the discussion of possible abuses uh, be put before the American people. I'm concerned as well as my colleagues, I'm sure, are about the abuse of power uh, with federal agencies by the current administration, which deflects attention away from the uh, false charges and the improper firing of the White House travel employees. Calls, calls all indications to me from what I've heard so far today is that uh, they wanted to hire uh, their own friends as opposed to maintaining what was an apolitical office doing an excellent job on behalf of the executive branch. Uh, we'd like to ask a couple questions, if I may, to Mr. Dale and others. Uh, the uh, table, and I want to also say, uh, join with my other colleagues who had said previously how much we appreciate your being here today and uh, being so candid with us. Uh, you heard about the kickback allegations that uh, Harry Thomason made at the White House that were passed on to the FBI, did you not? Yes, sir. Were you aware that the kickback issue is what the FBI said largely gave them jurisdiction and to get involved in the case? Yes, sir, I am. Did you also know that the White House learned very early on in the, in the management review that the kickback allegation was non-existent, yet they did not include it in the management review? No, sir, I don't think I knew that. Did you know that Harry Thomason himself uh, talked with Miami Air President Ross Fisher, who says he told Mr. Thomason he never said anything about kickbacks? I've read that in the news, yes. Did you know that when GAO interviewed all the various uh, carriers that you worked with, that not one provided any evidence of kickbacks? Yes, sir, I know that. Yet you continued to uh, get investigated about this bogus claim, did you not? Yes, I did. Uh, did you know the, uh, the White House Management Review draft of June 26, 1993 actually included a section which read as follows. In early March, Martins tells Thompson again about his conversation with Dale and about the further information he has gathered on the travel office. Martins also tells Thompson that he has heard about a conversation between Dale and the president of Miami Air in which Dale allegedly told Miami Air that it would have to pay some form of special remuneration to secure White House business. Evidently, what Martin's heard from Penny Sample was that the travel office had its own agenda with regard to hiring charter carriers. And what Sample had heard from Ross Fisher, President of Miami Air, was what he thought Airline of the Americas, now doing business as Ultra Air, had a special relationship with the travel office. But Fisher has stated that Dale never solicited a payment from him and that he never made such an allegation. In other words, the draft report included in this section which would have demonstrated to all that this kickback allegation was false and the result of rumors being propounded by Darnell Martins and Harry Thomason, who spread the word around the White House. Was the White House protecting Mr. Thomason against civil suits, or why was this exculpatory information omitted from the final report, if you know? I, I don't know. In fact, in your time period in the uh, White House travel office, did you ever know, were you aware of any wrongdoing by any of your fellow employees? No, sir. Had there ever been a prior administration which had asked you to uh, make special considerations uh, for one travel agency or another? I'm not quite sure I understand. That, was there any request by a prior administration uh, that there was wrongdoing in the office? No, sir. Or that there was any kickback allegations in prior administration? No, sir. And any uh, prior administration uh, come in wholesale and try to remove seven employees without cause? No, sir. Uh, Mr. Brousseau, can I ask you a couple questions? Yes, sir. I understand that you asked for something in writing after learning that you and all your colleagues have been fired. Yes, sir, that's Is that the correct. Case? And who did you ask to give you something in writing? Uh, when we were fired, uh, Mr. Watkins fired us, but he had a colleague with him, Mr. Brian Folcourt, I believe was his last name. And I asked uh, Mr. Folcourt. 
And on how many occasions did you ask for something in writing? I asked him right after that meeting. Uh, later that uh, afternoon, I ran into Mr. Watkins in the hall uh, and asked Mr. Watkins. Uh, Mr. Folkhart initially told me that uh, he would have it, try to have it to me before the day was out. Mr. Watkins said uh, when I saw him that afternoon that uh, he couldn't get it to, to me, but he'd get it in the mail. And then when I called his office a week later, they told me it was in the mail. One of his secretaries. I'm not sure who I talked to when I called his office. And obviously, I never received anything. You never received anything from the White House as to why you're being terminated? That's correct. Did they say it was for cause or not for cause? No, they didn't. When, they when, said nothing. They didn't say anything. I never received anything. That's correct. So how did you learn that you were terminated? Well, at the meeting, when Mr. Watkins terminated. He said, uh, based on the Pete Morrick review, uh, that found some sloppy ac accounting and mismanagement uh, that they thought they could do the job better and uh, be out of here by noon. Did he give you a chance to respond to the PMR report? No, he was talking as he backed out the door. So you never got a chance to, re to rebut it at all? No, sir, not at all. You could have understood being terminated because you're working in a, a White House, which has a change of administrations now and again, uh, and been given a chance to work elsewhere, but without having the, the firing without cause. Well, we, we understood uh, at that time when we were fired, we, we understood that that could have happened any time, and we had accepted it. That, uh, that was uh, the way of life there. And, uh, but if I understand how gentlemen feel at the table this, morning, uh, this afternoon, is that what you feel is unfair is the fact that you've always been doing your job and that you were fired without cause. Yeah. Would the gentleman yield? I would glad to yield. Uh, it's my understanding that the report was not even given to the White House at the time that they were fired. Is, am I correct? That's correct. I believe so, yeah. So they said they were firing you based upon the sloppiness put it, that they found in that report, but they didn't even have the report yet. It That's hadn't correct. even come out yet. I so thank the, the gentleman for feeling. I reclaim my time and just finally comment Point that. Of information, uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask? I have the floor. Uh, the gentleman has the floor. You're asking him to yield. Will, will you yield for a clarifying point? I, I still have, I, I have only 15 seconds. I can't yield. I want to just ask, make the further comment that uh, it's just shocking to me and the American public to see that uh, people who have been doing their job professionally from 9 to 32 years should be summarily dismissed without cause it is not only a travesty, it's downright unfair. And I hope that the, the wrongs are righted by new procedures we develop in making sure that the executive branch upholds the same kinds of uh, oath to the public people as the Congress does. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from West Virginia. I'm sorry. Uh, could I pass to Mr. Moran and come back? I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran, for five minutes. I thank my friend from West Virginia, and I thank the chairman. And I want to go right back to what Mr. Fox just said, that the executive branch ought to uphold the same principles that the Congress does. You know, the Congress, under the new Republican leadership, just fired 11 people that have worked for the House of Representatives from 15 to 32 years. Uh, none of them were told why. Uh, we found out the reason why is because we passed legislation that would make us responsible for the same kind of uh, workforce laws that apply to the private sector. The and so to avoid application of those private sector laws, we fired these people summarily. You know, here's gentleman yield? Nancy. No, not right now. I want to make my point, and then I'll see what you have in mind. But I haven't had a chance to make a point yet, John, so I'm going to take this opportunity because it's one that we need to bear in mind. Uh, we ought not be hypocritical about, here, about this. You know, I'm, I am sympathetic to, uh, to employees, but uh, if uh, here's one woman that worked for 34 years for the Congress. Uh, and she got a form letter pink slip without so much as her name on it from us. Was she uh, accused of being John a crook? Kostelnik had a quota of staff to fire, and uh, he refused, and so he was fired. He was in charge of office furnishings. We've got people that worked for the house for, since they were teenagers, 20 years, terminated, and they didn't even get their name on the termination slip. Not a word of thank you. Uh, uh, people throughout the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, were summarily fired because we didn't want them to get compensation for the comp time that they had developed when they worked late hours in the House. 
and to avoid that liability, we fired them and never even said thank you for your service to this institution. Uh, so if, if that's the policy that we want to be consistent with, the gentleman uh, briefly yield. Uh, very quickly, Mr. Uh, Fox, yeah. Yes, just briefly. I think the distinction is that we didn't have the FBI brought in falsely to charge employees with wrongdoing in a criminal way. And I understand otherwise there's some analogous points that you can make. But that, there's a clearly a distinction here with employees who've been there 34 years in the White House falsely being accused, bringing in the White House. Mr. I mean, the Fox, FBI to buttress a claim which was Mr. false. Mr. Fox, I, I'll address that since you brought it up. None of these employees took tens of thousands of dollars of public funds and put them in their home, uh, in cash, in their account. The gentleman yields. Uh, they, the gentleman yields. Well, I will subsequently. Mr. You know, Mr. I, Speaker, I object. You're going to give me Mr. some Mr. Speaker, I make an, I make an objection. To... The gentleman here has not been at the hearing. He is making an accusation that simply isn't true. And it is unfair to those witnesses to, to make accusations. If you've been here, you would know the accusations you make are not true. Uh, uh, I strongly object that to The it. gentleman uh, needs to be corrected and that there was not public funds. These were. These were private they were funds. Reimbursements. They were not public funds. Uh, but, but point of clarification, Mr. Travel. Chairman, the gentleman is correct that there were allegations of funds being put into personal accounts. Yeah, but not public funds. Correct. They were, well, they were reimbursements that were related to the function that the gentleman was providing. Now, uh, you know, I can understand how those things happen. You've got a responsibility to make things run. And from the people I have talked to, the reporters, they felt that you made things run and that, in fact, the staff did a good job. It was a high-pressure job. Uh, it, uh, you had to respond immediately. And, uh, and the fact is that you did. Now, how you did that and uh, whether or not uh, funds were mixed as has been charged or not, I think there are probably explanations for that. And I am not going to accuse Mr. Dale or anyone else of wrongdoing until it is proved in a court of trial. You already uh, did accuse him of that, Mr. Moran. I and he said was found that innocent. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Virginia has the time. Mr. Shays, I said that none of these employees had any money, uh, public money, in their home. That's what I said. I referred to the employees that were summarily fired without cause. And I think we ought to be, uh, you know, here's a, an article on the front page of the Hill newspaper, about 113 people that work for the post office were fired without cause. Now, it's going to be privatized, fine. But, uh, you know, there's ample uh, precedent for people being let go who serve at the pleasure of the president or the Congress. Uh, now, I think uh, if, uh, the, uh, if you think about it, the fact that all we can come up with from this administration uh, is something that happened in the first few days of the administration. I can't imagine that they are so squeaky clean that this is all that, can, that they can come up with when you have a Pete Marwick study that shows phenomenal management inconsistencies. Granted, the, the fact that this is not a typical bureaucratic function, that you have to react quickly, you have to use what resources are available, you have to exercise judgment, Nobody's perfect. Uh, but anyone that wanted to find cause for firing one or all of the staff in this Pete Marwick report could find that. And apparently, rumors circulated that were substantiated by the Pete Marwick report. The point is not whether uh, it was, the firing was, uh, was fair or not. Those kinds of things happen. And I don't know whether or not they were fair. The point is whether this is worth all the national attention that it's getting, the kinds of accusations that have been made at the First Lady, at presidential staff, the kind of time that has been devoted to this hearing, when, when we have so many profoundly important issues that we can't deal with because we're dealing with, some, with, uh, with half a dozen people who, don't, time who wish they weren't expired. fired. But it happens all the time. The gentleman's Thank time has expired, but I will give the uh, panel to an opportunity to respond to some of the points. Uh, Mr. Moran, would you just agree that the covering letter from Pete Marwick read, as you know, the procedures were revised throughout our on-site work to reflect the time frame and limited availability of data, information, and documented policies and procedures. As such, this report may not necessarily disclose all significant matters about the press travel office or reveal errors or irregularities, if any. 
in the underlying information. Our procedures do not constitute an audit, examination, or review in accordance with the standards established by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, and therefore we do not express an opinion or any other form of assurance on the information presented in our report. Will you accept that that was their covering letter? That is the covering letter to virtually every audit. Thank you, sir. And, uh, and the fact is that Thomas, in any corporation, ahead. that would be a damning audit that where heads would roll. In the any corporation, uh, as in any public entity. The gentleman's time has expired, and I will now recognize the gentleman from Mississippi for five minutes. Are you? Thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, okay, Mr. Chairman. I recognize Mr. I apologize. Mr. Taylor. The defense and authorization Mr. bill was on the floor. And the R&D committee was meeting simultaneously. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, what I want to say is that I, I think these hearings prove really just one thing. We're here to serve the public. And I think the public would best be served if the White House Travel Office was closed. This nation is going through a process of downsizing. 200,000 federal employees since President Clinton took office. Serve on the Armed Services Committee. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have been let go, not given the opportunity to re-enlist since 1989. We have a third fewer congressional staffers. And just today, as my friend Mr. Moran pointed out, 113 postal employees were let go. No one takes any great pride in this. But we have a nation that's spending $270 billion a year more than collection taxes and squandering $300 billion a year in interest on that debt, and something's got to give. I have never been so unfortunate as to be fired, but it could happen to anyone in this room next November. So I do have empathy for you, but the point is not these gentlemen, it's not the White House, it's the need to reduce government spending. Reporters are smart people. If you don't believe me, ask them. Reporters can make their own travel arrangements. There are travel agencies all over this town. Citizens of this country do not need to have a travel office in the White House or anyone else to make reporters' lives easier for them. That's what it's all about. Shut it down. Don't privatize it. Don't put it out for bid. Let reporters do what business people all across this country do on a regular basis, and that is make their own travel. Would the gentleman yield, please? If these gentlemen feel like they have been wronged, there are courts for them to go to if they feel like that they, they have been slandered. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, Mr. Burton. Thank you. I'll just take a minute. But one of the problems is they, they went into this in some detail earlier today. When the president has to go someplace and the, and the White House press corps is going to go with him, there's a security problem. The Secret Service doesn't want that sort of information let out. And these people have to go with the president at the time the president goes, and they use charter airlines. And if you didn't have some central location or group to do this, you couldn't do it. It wouldn't work. And so Mr. what you're talking Burton, about simply Burton, won't work. I'm claiming my time. Everyone in this town can find some reason for a special privilege and for government to do something special for them, including reporters. I think reporters are smart enough to make their own travel arrangements. I think this was done to, to kind of schmooze up to the press. All of us are guilty of that. There's absolutely no reason on earth to have a White House travel office. Maybe there was in the past. But I plan to introduce legislation, Mr. Chairman, I would hope you would introduce legislation to abolish the White House travel office. Don't privatize, just do away with it. And if Mr. Burton chooses to start that business himself, God bless him. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I ask one I question? For, I, Mr. Chairman, I yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Ken Jorsky. Mr. Chairman, can I ask you one question, please? Uh, would we do away with every travel office and every government agency? I think every government agency in Washington uh, has a uh, travel office uh, uh, that they use either on site or somewhere within town. I, I hope that won't be on my time, Mr. Chairman. It's on your time. <laughs> may I respond to that? Uh, but I think Mr. Kandorsky yeah, has may, may I protect the time for a moment? May I say that I join with the gentleman from Mississippi that uh, I spent two years of my life investigating the travel of the executive branch under George Bush as President of the United States. And I have never seen the t likes of which justifications can be made for taking aircraft, using limousines, doing all kinds of silly things when you happen to get a title and you come to Washington, D.C. 
And let me say that I agree with him, and the press has done nothing less than they, they, they may not sometimes get the salary commensurate with what they think they should be paid, but they certainly do want the perks equal or better than anything we do up here on the Hill, but they don't ever seem to disclose it. I absolutely agree. Let's do away with the office, let them handle their own thing. Uh, gentlemen, except for the fact of how this was handled, and, poor, and I would concede it, as a matter of fact, I think last week when Mr. Watkins testified, I said it was dumb, dumber, and dumbest. And the dumb thing was what they first did and how they handled it at the White House. The dumber thing is this committee got involved. Uh, that was the dumber thing. And the dumbest thing was when Mr. Watkins didn't testify openly on television so the American people would hear what it was all about. Because after he testified here for five hours, it was very clear to me, and I think anyone who would have listened to him on a, on a television screen, that there were seven unhappy people here, some of which ulti ultimately, one of which ultimately was indicted and went to trial and spent a lot of money. But I have enough faith in our system to say that if the grand jury didn't have enough evidence, it wouldn't have indicted. If a judge hadn't looked at the indictment and had the prosecutors come forth and they have ethical standards that they have to meet, they would have moved for an immediate dismissal of those indictments if they thought they were wrong. There was a sufficient element of facts for them to warrant that the issue should go before a jury. In our system, a jury heard that evidence, did not concur with the grand jury, did not return a verdict of guilty, and acquitted you. And you have that benefit. You've paid a price, Mr. Dale. We all know that. But every one of us that are subjected to that type of situation every day of our lives in our system, judicial system, has to pay that price. Now, if you have something different to add to that, did these prosecutors do something wrong? Did those judges do something wrong? Did that grand jury do something wrong? Let's get them in here and find out, and I'll be your best advocate. But let's get off this silliness. The gentleman's time has expired, but I will give Mr. Dale an opportunity to respond to the question. Mr. Ken Jorsky, on the 24th of October, you sat here and you associated me with the offices that brought back Mercedes from Germany on military airplanes. You associated me with the office that sent White House staffers out in cars for lunches and kept the cars sitting on street corners while they wait, went to lunch. And if you investigated the George Bush travel office, you did not investigate my office. I did hearing I did not investigate your office. But you associated me with I those. Ju you just mentioned some of the horrendous things that happened during the Bush administration. No, sir. Those Mercedes. Uh, they happened in the Reagan administration Mr. early in the 80s. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm what gonna, was it? I'm Let's set the record this. straight. 17 or 19 multi-hundreds thousands of dollars of cars came into this time country has expired. in avoidance of custody. This is, a subject I, I have of, no this idea is not the subject of this hearing, and I Did will, now recognize, ever investigate that, Mr. I will now recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, finally, Mr. Wise, for five minutes. Uh, before I yield my time, Mr. Chairman, let me just say, that it does seem to me that this seems to me that everyone agrees that there was terrible handling in the beginning of the dismissal of these gentlemen. The testimony I heard last week suggests to me that many of these gentlemen would have been dismissed in the course of the National Performance Review anyhow over a course of time, but done in a, in a, in a logical manner. Uh, walking in and firing seven people is not a good way to handle business. Um, and so the irony is that they probably would have been at the same point, but yet not without, but without all of this uh, controversy. But I, I still am concerned is because I haven't heard anything that's indictable yet. It seems to me this committee ought to be involved. Yes, there are a lot of dumb mistakes, and if we want to drag this out for about three or four more days with dumb mistakes, uh, but being dumb is, un is not indictable. If it were, nobody would be left in Washington. And so... I guess I have to ask what's the purpose of this proceeding, but I'll get around to that in the second round of my hearings. I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Kondorsky. Thank you very much, Chair. West Virginia. Mr. Dale, I, I am a little bit disturbed because I, I have heard a lot of comments, read a lot of things, and uh, I, I come from a little town in northeastern Pennsylvania, and I practiced law for more than 20 years of my life and ran a law firm. And I dealt with people who would pay their bills in cash and people who would pay their bills in checks. And I had some junior partners and 
and I had associates and I had staff working for me and office personnel. And I'm astounded when I, when I see somebody who takes cash home and keeps it in his home. I'm astounded when someone takes uh, funds that otherwise are business funds and puts them into personal accounts. If my staff had ever done that, they call that commingling in the law. And there's a presumption that it's wrong, that any rational, reasonable person knows they don't take their employer's funds or trust funds that they're empowered with and take them home. Neither did I. You haven't been here and you didn't hear me. I never took any office funds home with me unless I was traveling the next day and needed the, the money for the trip, as all of us did. Well, then you, then you did take them home. I, it's not that you never did. You did when you were traveling. Mr. Kanjorski, if you travel and you go get an advance, do you take it home with you? Or do you leave it in the office? It doesn't do you any good to go out on the road and travel if your petty cash is back in the office. No, Mr. Kanjorski. No, 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 Ms. Burton, you and I were sat on the same committee and examined the Bush administration. You, well, I know. That's right. And just how bad it was. No, and I remember the things that we and discussed. And I have to say this, Mr. Dale, that you're probably the product of the investigation that my subcommittee made and Mr. Burton was a part of because we did hear about Mr. Sununu and how wasteful he was. And I had nothing to do wait, with no, Mr. Wait a second. Sununu. And the Clintons and the Gores heard about it. And they and their friends heard about it. And anybody in Washington at the time was embarrassed. It wasn't George Bush or Barbara Bush that was responsible. I hope the heavens that they were spending their time and I know they were, deciding the important issues that face the American people. Will the gentleman yield just briefly to, to make the point that uh, you, I'm sure you appreciate that this, these gentlemen were not involved in anything having to do with the travel of Mr. Sununu. The travel office doesn't deal with White House personnel travel. It only deals with the press corps. Mr. So. Chairman, I fully understand that. And what I am saying is that they don't seem aware of the fact of what culture this new administration came into the White House, having spent and listened to through the entire year prior to their election of horrendous, wasteful conditions of travel in the executive branch of the White House. Not this particular office, but everybody else. So when the friends of the Clintons called them personally and said, we hear rumors of kickbacks in your travel office, we hear lack of bidding, we hear special conditions, we hear people are traveling with cash and paying cash, we hear gifts are being made. You don't think it was reasonable for these new people arrived in Washington after a year of hearing $100 million squandered in travel in the White House to be a little cautious and then try and decide what to do? What did Mr. Watkins tell us last week? He said he went into the General's Counsel's office and they didn't know what to do. But they all remembered there was a thing called the FBI and they thought that was the federal police force and they thought maybe they better call them in because they've heard the potential of criminality. And that's what they did. Rightly, wrongly, did they have justification for doing it? Was that the proper process? We'll probably never know. But as, as my friend from Mississippi, as my friend from West Virginia, and my friend from uh, 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 Virginia have said, you know, when are we going to spend our time on this committee and with the occasion that happened to the White House on something more rational? There's nothing we can do for these people. We've I, I hope we've apologized. I certainly do. If you've been discovered, and I know you have, you have my apology as a, an official of the United States government. But I can tell you. Believe it. You honestly don't sound like you believe it. That I believe what? You, you are saying it as if it's words without meaning because your actions don't demonstrate that you really are sorry. Grace, you're getting much harsher in your old age. Mr. Kenjorski, are you trying to say that I was some way involved in Mr. Sununu's personal travel by... No, I'm not suggesting that. I'm well, suggesting... You bring it up. I am suggesting to you that all of America knew there was a problem with travel. It was on national television when this new young administration with inexperienced people took over the White House. They didn't know what group did what to whom on travel. And their best friends, their highest confidences with them, told them there was something happening in this little office, and they took action. May have been precipitous, may have been dumb, and if we had to indict someone for dumbness, we probably would, this, this early administration. 
But we, 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 there's no criminality. There's no unethical conduct here. You have expended money. There's been embarrassment, and you've lost your jobs. But so have thousands, hundreds of thousands of other federal workers done the same thing. Most Gentleman's recently, time for no cause expired. at all. Gentleman's time has expired. I, I would, I, I'm going to now uh, announce that we will have, I understand, a, so there are questions that still uh, members would like to complete. We've completed it, one full round of questioning. Uh, there are members who still have questions they would like to ask. We will go until the, all the questions have been asked and responded to. I am, however, going to limit the time uh, for this round uh, to three minutes uh, per questioner. Uh, and uh, we'll start. Could I uh, question you on why we are doing that? Uh, I've been here all day. I have heard accusations on colleagues on my other side. All right, and all I, right. I, I hear you, and, and you want to go the full time. I would then ask unanimous consent that the time be limited to three minutes. And objection is heard. The, I will take the first uh, round of questions. And let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Dale. I think it's important. When you were fired, in fact, this is a question that would be addressed to all of the members of the panel here. It was the 19th of May, wasn't it? And uh, some of you were abroad at the time and heard about it through the news media or from personal phone calls. Is that correct? Uh, were you told, and I think this, you've made this point, but I think it really has to be hammered home, were you given uh, reasons for the firing? Were you told that this was for cause? As I remember, the terminology was that we were being terminated because they were going to outsource some of our services. They did make reference to the Pete Marwick uh, audit. But did you see the Pete Marwick no, audit? No, I did not. Uh, are you now subsequently become aware that the Pete Marwick uh, report was not even finished at that point? Yes, sir, I'm aware of that. Uh, so none of you were ever given, uh, did you receive a copy of the Pete Marwick report from personnel in the White House subsequent to your firing? No, sir. So none of you were ever uh, shown that as a result or, as, or given the reason that this was uh, the cause of your firing? No, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in fact, I was away uh, and got back that Monday, the 24th, and had learned about everything through, through TV. And actually, when I got the personnel, I had asked on three different occasions for something in writing from the White House as to why I was fired. And I had put before me by personnel a prepared letter of resignation stating that I was resigning due to change of administration. And you refused to I sign refused that letter, sign is that yes, correct? And then you were escorted out of, I was the, escorted uh, out of the office. And I think that you were then, I believe, uh, all of you, or those of you who were told on the 19th, that your uh, services were no longer rendered. How did you then leave the White House? Under what conditions or circumstances did you leave the White House? We left in, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we left uh, in a panel van. But I'd also like to say, uh, when I went to personnel, my resignation form was blank. They just wanted my signature. Mm -hmm. so All right. Uh, did you sign that? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. Right. I did not. Uh, Mr. Dale, how did you leave the uh, White House? Someone within the office had called the White House garage and asked if a van could come and take us with our personal belongings to our vehicles on the ellipse, and they sent a cargo van, and uh, five of us left in that. It, so you were crammed in the back of a cargo van? Is that yes, sir, with no seats. Well, it just seems to me that this is the most unbelievably demeaning, humiliating, uh, it's just appalling to me that the, uh, the insensitivity and the... Uh, the way this thing was handled. I mean, it just really uh, is a, a very upsetting. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions about documents that, and papers and uh, records that uh, seem to have disappeared. Uh, shortly after Catherine Cornelius started working in the travel office, uh, records did begin to disappear, did they not? And I think we've had discussions about money being taken home. We now know that documents were taken home, do we not? Yes, sir. Uh, could you explain how you all learned of missing records? When I came back from leave two weeks after Catherine Cornelius had been in the office, Gary Wright met me the morning I walked in on Monday morning and said, Billy, there's something in your middle drawer I think you better take a look at. I went to my middle drawer, pulled out a Xerox copy of a check payable to Pan American World Airways in the amount of $288,000. 
that I had written approximately two and a half years prior to that. I asked Gary, what do you mean I should take a look at this? And he said, when we came in the office last Friday morning, the Xerox machine was jammed, and we had to call a technician to unjam it. And this is what he found. And he said, I made the comment, or someone made the comment at that time, oh, do you mean this has been in there for two and a half years? Did, did you inquire of Catherine Cornelius uh, when you found copy documents in the machine? Well, I think Gary did. Gary? And she pleaded ignorance to the uh, to any knowledge of the check or anything else, and uh, suggested that perhaps we should secure the uh, canceled check statements uh, in a more secure location, okay. which I did. I believe that uh, Patsy Thomason, who was in the uh, Office of Administration at that time, did she have keys and access to all of the offices in the White House, and including the travel office? Well. I don't know that she had keys, but that she had access to, she had to access get them. To and isn't it true that she was in your office one morning by herself uh, before any of you came to work? That's true. On the Friday before I left work, the Friday the, of what? You remember what Friday, day? the 14th of May. 14th of May. She, uh, about 10 o'clock at night, it was apparent that Pete Marwick was not going to finish their work that day, and they, she suggested we go home and come back the next morning. And I said, well, I'll wait till everybody's out and I can lock up. And she said, you don't need to worry about that. I have GSA coming to change the locks on your office, and I'll have the keys to them. Mm -hmm. And I, we never had keys after that. When you were uh, uh, fired, you came back to your office, I believe, to find, I mean, you'd been called upstairs by Mr. Watkins and told that this was, uh, uh, you know, this was sayonara, you were done for, and you came back to your office, and I believe, you found people already, as I understand it, at work, at your workstations, uh, presumably attempting to take over the work of the travel office? That's correct. Where did they come from? Some of them were from worldwide travel in Little Rock. Some of them were OMB employees, and uh, some of them, I don't know who they were. There were approximately 12 to 14 people. So they had to have been really uh, brought in uh, prior to the day that you were actually fired, or they had to be on the scene before that time, before the Pete Marwick uh, study was completed or final report was done, didn't that? I have since found that the people from Worldwide Travel were staying in a hotel room here in Washington from the previous Thursday. Previous Thursday, again, um, sub substantially before there was uh, a Pete Marwick study or before the FBI was involved or anybody else. Is that yes, sir. Is that correct? Uh, how many were records missing from your office as a result of after Patsy Thomason was there and the occasion you mentioned earlier? Sir, I don't know because I didn't have a chance to inventory the records. After that, you never had a chance to. No, sir. It. My time has expired. I now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many of us today have expressed concern not only for the seven employees here today, but all federal employees, particularly those that were furloughed during the shutdown. I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Van Immeren, uh, were you furloughed? Yes, I was. And where were you transferred to? Where were you working when this happened? Uh, you're referring to the, the latest furlough? Yes, yes. Uh, the Department of Commerce. Yeah, the Department of Commerce. Mr. Wright, were you furloughed? I've been retired. You were retired. Uh, Ms. Russi, were you furloughed? I was furloughed the first time. I'm with GSA the second time I was working. Okay. Mr. Dale? I'm retired. Mr. McSweeney? I was on, uh, on duty the first time, and I retired before the second time. Okay. And uh, I also worked for a GSA, and I was furloughed the first time, but not the second. I was with the Department of Defense and was furloughed the first time and retired before the second one came around. Well, those of you that were furloughed I, this last time, it's just you, Mr. Van Emmeren, and, and you were at Commerce. That was one of the departments that was shut down. Uh, did you miss any paychecks? I, re I missed, I was paid for uh, one week instead of the normal two, two week pay period. I was paid for one week. So you did uh, miss a paycheck due to the Republican shutdown. During the time that you were in transition from, uh, from this job or fired from this job, did you ever lose a check? Did you ever lose payment? No, I did not. You did not lose payment. Um, I understand that you are now, or are you civil service now? Yes, I you am. You are civil service now. 
is it better to be a civil service employee as opposed to a uh, political appointee as you were at the travel office that serves at the pleasure of the president? I was not a political appointee. I was career civil service at the White House, civil service. but we came under the accepted civil service, which meant that we served at the pleasure of the president. But uh, is it better to serve under civil service where you do not serve at the pleasure of the president, but... Well, certainly there are advantages to it. You have more rights. I'd uh, like to go back to the line of questioning that my uh, colleague, Mr. Chikandorsky, had earlier. Um, Mr. Dale, it's my understanding that the criminal case against you is based in part on the fact that from February 1988 to April of 1991, on 55 different occasions, you deposited checks into your personal account and that these checks were refunds from different vendors which were intended to reimburse the employees of the press for their expenses. Are, are these facts correct? Essentially, yes. They are essentially correct. It, it also is uh, my understanding from the documents that you did not tell any of the other witnesses on the panel or anyone else that you were depositing these checks intended to reimburse the press, the employees of the, the press, into your uh, personal account. Is uh, that correct? That's correct, along with a lot of other things I didn't tell them. Uh, Mr. Dale, uh, most people would at least be somewhat suspicious if a government employee deposited checks intended to reimburse the press into their personal account. Why didn't you tell someone else in the office about this rather unusual procedure if for no other reason than to protect yourself from suspicion? Because I had logs to prove where each and every dollar of that was spent and because it was my responsibility to maintain the surface. That's why I didn't tell them. Mr. Dale, the travel office maintained a Riggs bank account. That's right. According to your attorney's opening statement at trial, the reason you deposited checks intended to reimburse the press into your personal account is that you needed to establish a second account as a way to avoid having to charge the press for each and every cost. Your attorney um, characterized this system, and I quote, as a disastrous business judgment, end quote. In, in retrospect, uh, would it have been more reasonable to simply set up a second account called the travel office account at a bank? No, ma'am. It was a disastrous decision on my part. I readily admit that. But there's no other way that I would have done anything else in the travel office other than that. I, if I set up another, a second account at another bank, that, that's going to mean that the surplus is increasing and I've got to work it off. The money that I cashed from those checks was in the travel office at all times unless up until it was spent on official trips. And how did you work it off? I worked it off by paying for unused hotel rooms. I worked it off by paying for catering, for electricians and press centers, for the ground handlers in a place like Seoul, Korea, Singapore, Indonesia, places like that. Mr. Dale, you're, according to your attorney's opening statement, you used your own personal cash that you kept at home for various cash expenses that you and your staff incurred on trips. You then reimbursed yourself with the reduced checks intended to reimburse the press. You also used cash that you took from the White House travel account at Riggs Bank on these same trips. How did you keep track of what money came from the house and what money came from the Riggs account? For example, did you keep the money in separate pockets? Uh, how did you keep? No, ma'am. When I was traveling before 1988, there were many times, especially overseas, that I had to take money out of my own personal pocket to pay for expenses that I incurred on behalf of the press and reimburse myself once I got back to Washington. And when I traveled overseas, if I took $15,000 with me in petty cash, and if I spent it, then I allocated it from the different funds once I got back and determined 
what the other trip expenses were and what expenses I was going to bill to the press. Mm -hmm. Late time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton, for five minutes. Seconds to my colleague from uh, Florida. I think I've heard it all in the last 36 months I've been in Congress, uh, missing files and uh, reappearing files and stuff like that. I've got to leave, fellas, but I heard, heard it all. It took the cake this morning when you told me about the roses uh, that you got, and then they took them away. So as I leave, I got you each a rose, and you, can keep, <laughs> and you guys can keep these. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, Mr. Chairman, this is going to take a little longer than 15 seconds, but I guess I'll have to live with that. Let me, uh, can you hurry it up, Micah? You're on my time. I think you can, you can proceed. I think they can answer. Well, I, I have a question for Mr. Dale, and he's got to put his rose on or something. I don't know. Thank you. Let, let me, uh, thank Gentleman you. from Indiana. Okay, let me just say that uh, when I have, I'm, I've been on the International Operations or Foreign Affairs Committee for years, and our military attache, when we travel around the world, carries about fifteen or twenty thousand dollars with us because when you go to some third world country, when you land, sometimes you have to pay a landing fee and it has to be in cash. When you go to a McDonald's or someplace in the middle of the night to get food, it has to be paid in cash. And I want to ask you, Mr. Dale, when you traveled with the press corps, did you in, in, encounter the same kind of situation? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, now that is the reason why he had to have money at his home when he left at 3 o'clock in the morning to go on an international trip because he had to pay for these uh, incidental expenses that the, tr the, the press corps was going to incur, and these were not federal funds. Now, I want to say one more thing. He was found not guilty, and for the Democrats in this Congress to retry him before this committee is, 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 is unbelievable. He has been acquitted. And what they're bringing up right now are things that are normal, a normal course of business in traveling around the world for the press corps or for this government when we take an Air Force plane. Now, let me get into another thing here. One of the questions that's been raised by the minority is, you know, we're going after the White House, we're going after the First Lady, and we shouldn't be doing that. And, and one of the things that we've raised today is if the White House or the First Lady involved the FBI or the IRS in getting involved in this, there, have may, there may have been a misuse of power and a felony committed, and that's why we need to have these hearings and get to the bottom of it. We should check into whether or not the White House withheld information and whether or not there was a proper investigation of this by the Justice Department, and the Justice Department may not have had the records necessary uh, when this grand jury investigation took place and the prosecutor was, was, was investigating this. And so the people who indicted this man, who was later acquitted, may not have had all the facts before them. They may have been deliberately withheld by the White House. And if that's the case, that's obstruction of justice, and we need to get to the bottom of it. Now, regarding the First Lady, she has said time and again she was not involved. We have here notes from Mr. Watkins. Hell to pay if we didn't accede to the First Lady's wishes. Vince Foster regularly informed me that the First Lady was concerned in desired action. The desired action was the firing of the travel office staff. Now, we have this in, in place after place after place, memo after memo after memo. Hillary Rodham Clinton wanted these people fired, but she said she had nothing to do with it. Now we look at the chronology of events. They were fired on May the 19th. I, I, I need everybody's attention. They were fired on May the 19th. On May the 12th, Mr. Watkins, his notes say that Harry Thomason came to him and said, Hillary wants them all fired today. This is on May the 12th. Excuse me, guys. On May the 12th, Watkins' notes say, Harry Thomason came to him and said, Hillary wants them all fired today. Foster first learns of the travel office from Harry Thomason and Watkins. On May the 13th, according to Foster's own notes, he has his first conversation with the First Lady on this on this day. That's not consistent with the chronology of events. Now the First Lady says she didn't talk to Harry Thomason about this, but this was totally inconsistent with all the reports and all the evidence that we have. Now the First Lady says Foster was the source, but he didn't even talk to her until about, about this until May the 13th, the day after. 
Watkins' notes say that Harry Thomason came to him and said, Hillary wants them all fired. So Vince Foster, who she said was the source of all this, didn't even know about it until the day after Harry Thomason came to uh, Watkins and said that Hillary wanted him fired. Now, if that's the case, then the First Lady has lied, and that's why we need to continue to have these hearings. And if she lied about this, and if she or somebody at the White House asked the FBI to get involved, or if the White House did as this memo said, and it could be the First Lady, this, these are White House notes. It says, according to White House staff notes of an interview with Beth Nolan and Cliff Sloan at the White House Counsel's Office, BK, that's Bill Kennedy in the White House Counsel's Office, said that PR, that's Peggy Richardson, of the IRS commissioner is on top of it. She said at a party the IRS is on top of it and some reference to IRS agents are aware or something like that. And this they were talking about the ultra air down in Tennessee. Now if these things are accurate, then somebody at the White House was talking to the IRS about an investigation. That's illegal. If somebody at the White House got the FBI involved in this and misused the power of the White House, that's illegal. The First Lady, according to the notes we have, has lied because the chronology of events doesn't bear out what she said. And that's why I think it's absolutely essential, Mr. Chairman, that we bring all these people before this committee and get to the bottom of it. Because the end result is they could have fired these people anyhow, but they've hurt them, they've hurt their families, they've hurt their reputations, they've hurt their honor, and it didn't need to happen. It's a miscarriage of justice, and I think there's a real possibility there's an abuse of power, and some felonies have been con uh, committed. And I, I, I personally resent the, the minority retrying this case in this body when they have been, when the charges against Mr. Dale has been dismissed. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from West Virginia. Chairman, and I know the gentleman from Indiana then will want to join the minority in the application we've made to the chair to have the, those Justice Department officials as well as to have um, uh, the Pete Marwick officials come before this. It seems to me that you've got to get into what were the reasons behind the decisions to prosecute and certainly to have those professional prosecutors here discussing why they did would answer your questions but also I think bring a lot to this. I might add to the gentleman arrayed before me, uh, the gentleman from Florida who just with fanfare presented you those red roses. I don't know whether you're aware of it, while he gave you those red roses, he's part of the same leadership team that yesterday gave 113 pink slips to federal congressional employees without cause. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, our chairman, who very eloquently talked about the demeaning conduct way that you were ushered out of the White House, and I do happen to agree it was demeaning. Uh, uh, the way that you were ushered out in the back seat of a van, I can't consider anything more demeaning than hours before the protection for, federal, for congressional workers is to take effect. 113 of them are dismissed, given pink slips without notice, so the new contractor can come in. There's a lot of demeaning activity going along, and uh, just remember what's behind those roses, uh, a lot of pink slips. The, uh, at this point, I would yield to the gentlewoman, uh, Ms. Maloney, who I believe has uh, some, another question that she would like to ask. I, I uh, would like to ask the chairman if I could put into the record uh, something that just came off the AP wire in which uh, Larry Herman is talking directly to the AP writer, and he is taking exception to comments attributed to him at the hearing by a key Republican. And he said in a telephone interview, meaning today, meaning this hearing today, he said in a telephone interview, and I quote, that the audit did turn up mismanagement that might have justified at least the firing of Dale, end quote. Still, he said, and I quote, at the time they fired him, we were still writing our draft report. And I was surprised. Um, he goes on and he says, he says that a Representative Klinger, chairman of the Government Reform Committee, opened the hearing by saying Herman had told committee investigators he did not think his review warranted the firings. And I quote from Herman, we never made any re recommendations, nor were we ever asked for any recommendations on whether the president should terminate anybody, Herman said today, but he said his audit turned up evidence that Dale had written petty cash checks to himself and deposited them in his account. Such action, and I quote, I think probably does warrant some immediate action, Herman said. My personal assessment is that most companies today would question that and would include questioning whether to remove that person from that position. 
And it goes on and on and on. And I'd like to put it into the record. I, may I comment on that? Without objection, the, it will be entered in the record. I dispute no, no, no. that any petty cash funds were put into my account. That's precisely, Mr. Chairman, why we need to get Mr. Herman here. We have two different well, accounts. I count on the fact that Mr. Herman will be here because it is, that, 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 that is definitely not at variance, is at variance with what he told our investigators. So I think we will have him. Um, Mr. Chair, additional, yeah. uh, Mr. Dale, I'm going to, I think, switch uh, pretty much from where things have been. Was there, up until May the, let's say, 13th, um, was there competitive bidding for the services, uh, uh, the charter services? Yes, sir. So was there, there competitive bidding on every flight, or how did you Not handle? each and every flight. Mr. Wise, I can recall one time that I got a call at home at 9 o'clock at night and told me to have an airplane sitting at Point Magoo, California at 6 a.m. the next morning. This gentleman right here was in California. You don't have time to put uh, charters like that out for competitive bidding. I had approximately nine hours to get an airplane out there, and I went to the company that I felt like it could accommodate me. I understand that, but what about in practice in general? Did you there put, was, was there any kind of competitive bidding process with the forms to fill out? Or was there some there, kind of We had a form to fill out that indicated the airlines that I called, and after a while when you call United Airlines, 50 times and ask them if they're interested in doing a charter, and they tell you no, you get tired of calling them. It was a, to a point before Pan Am went out of business, they were the only ones that wanted the business. And after they went out of business, I had to scurry around and take whoever I could get. At the complaints of the White House Press Corps, they did not like the people that we were chartering and called me on the phone on occasions to tell me that. John McSweeney was on a, on a trip one time when the president of the Correspondence Association boarded the airplane and started complaining to him about the aircraft and how crowded it was. John McSweeney took his cell phone out, dialed my number in the office, and handed it to him. I took the coward's way out. So I'm the one who bore those, those complaints, yes. Certainly. You, you mentioned um, in the competitive bidding that only Pan Am wanted to do the job. Who is handling the chartering now? Is there any company out there that will handle the chartering? They're obviously scheduled carriers that I dealt with because just in the last two weeks, my contact at one of the scheduled carriers told me that they would not charter to the White House without payment up front. Well, they're, they're obviously working because uh, the press is accompanying the uh, the president went on his foreign trips. So there must be some chartering firms that are willing to do the business. One of the gentlemen sitting against the wall right over here is a gentleman that traveled with both of us, the Clinton White House and me. I think he's the better one to answer who provided the best service. That's not the issue. That's not what we're looking at now. That's exactly what I was tasked with, is to provide a con comfortable, convenient service for the White House Press Corps. If I could, one last question. Mr. Uh, uh, Dale, last week, or within the Watkins hearing, uh, a draft GAO study, a believe dated December 1995, was brought up about how the White House uh, travel office had improved uh, in 26 of 29 areas. Have you had a chance to review that uh, report? No, sir. I, I would really like to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would question the GAO. Do they know who to go to and talk to? Do they know which office to go to that the State Department to see if the White House Travel Office is reimbursing the government for funds expended on behalf of the press corps that I used to pay for, that I used to use as petty cash to pay for. Check it out. They haven't been paid since I left the White House. Thank you. Hired, and I'm now going to yield to the gentlelady from Maryland and ask her if she might yield 30 seconds to me, just to make one quick. I would yield 30 seconds. Just to clarify again, uh, the <laughs> thank the gentlelady. Just to clarify again, the the uh, element that was raised here about the 113 postal workers who were fired, but unlike uh, you gentlemen, they really were aware back in June that this was likely to happen because, in fact, the, uh, the office was going to be privatized. So it wasn't as though they suddenly were told the day that they were fired that they were supposed to be out of there. Second factor is that 92 of the 119 of them were, in fact, offered other employment. I don't think that that was the case, at least initially, in your case. And I thank generally agree. Point of information, Mr. Chairman. Point of information. Um, 
I, op, not, not on, on my Mrs. time. Not on Mrs. Merrill's yeah, but, time. But could I just get a point? Mr. Dale, you said people had not been paid. Would you clarify who has not been paid? The United States government, Department of State, the embassies around the world. It's my understanding. The, the, the United <clears throat> States government has not been paid by the Clinton White House? Is that, what are you saying? Here? It's my understanding that the embassies on foreign trips that pick up expenses after the trip has left their city, and if they've had to pay for any unused rooms on behalf of the press corps or any incidental charges that I would have reimbursed them for, they told me that they have not been paid for any charge such as that since I left the White House. But why would the government pay for the presses staying the, in their rooms was, and their boards? It was just supposed to be just a transfer because that embassy does business with those hotels on a companion basis and they pay for it in order to stay in good standing with the hotel and they expect to get reimbursed by the White House Travel Office. But my question is, if it is not White House personnel, and if it is not White House business, yet employees from the private sector, employed by the private sector press, that is incurring these expenses, my question is, why should the federal government and the taxpayers' dollars pay for that? Why doesn't AP pay for the rooms of the AP reporters? Why doesn't not, the New York Times pay for the rooms of the New York I'm Times reporters? The, uh, I think I may have confused you. These are not rooms that were used. These are rooms that were reserved and not used. But then they were billed for them. So the cost was incurred to, you're saying that the White House did not pay for this cost. My question to you is, why should it be a White House cost? It is a private industry cost. That's exactly I'm going to reclaim I'm going to reclaim the time because the time and I'm going to start the clock again. The gentlelady from Maryland has four and a half minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I started off here this morning and I'm here at the end. And I have heard over and over again the statements that have been made and some people who were not here. But what we do know, I do not think this hearing has to do with being a Republican or a Democrat or an independent, or a libertarian, or whatever political persuasion one may have. It has to do with some people being treated wrongly for no fault of their own, and something that, because they are civil servants, particularly we have a role to play to make sure this doesn't happen again, and that we say to them, we are sorry, and we correct the problem. I have listened to the stories of Mr. Dale's daughters, weddings, expenses, uh, being investigated, others who may have property, being checked on whether they had the ability to pay for it. Um, three uh, three of the, of the uh, witnesses, uh, parents, fathers, passed away during this. Uh, uh, careers that were jeopardized. Uh, Mr. McSweeney's early retirement with reduced annuity. Hearing also on Dateline, NBC, of Mr. Dale talking about waking up at night to his wife sobbing in bed uh, and that uh, he himself was pacing the floor at night. I can't imagine people going, going through this who were investigated by the FBI, the IRS, over such a long period of time. And then we talk about down downsizing the White House travel office. Frankly, it has been uh, upsized since the change took place. I think now there are nine employees there rather than even a reduction from, this, from the seven. So that statement is kind of uh, uh, thrown out. Um, and, and when we had Mr. Watkins appear before this uh, committee last week, we heard at least half a dozen times the fact that Mr. Watkins said that this was a result of a desire for press opportunity. Now, you may have heard that too. I don't think anyone during the day has asked you how you would respond to this so-called planned or desired press opportunity, uh, one that would jeopardize people's livelihoods and careers. Um, I wondered if you'd like to comment on that press opportunity situation. I think that Mr. might fit in with some of the decisions that Mr. Watkins has continued to make. He made a wrong decision. It was a hell of a press opportunity, and look what he look, look what he found himself with. Mm -hmm. Any of the others hear about this concept of a press opportunity? Because I saw that statement where he mentioned that they needed some positive press, and uh, this is what they wanted to do, and I was I was obviously very disappointed. 
doesn't show much in the way of logical thinking or caring about people. I'm also concerned about what this whole episode has to say to our young people whom we would like to um, uh, have interested in public service. I mean, do I want to work for the federal government? Do I want to dedicate my, my life to the federal government knowing that there is a possibility that I might be treated in this manner? Whether I would recommend that they do, and I would hope that this was an isolated incident. I wouldn't think that, I wouldn't want to go to my grave thinking that this government operates that way, and I don't think that. I, I would agree with you, and I think that's why it's important that we isolate it here in this committee and say this shall not happen again. I, I was reminded of a, a line from uh, Othello, um, which I think, um, I think states what we all feel and how you feel, certainly. Um, in Act Three, the statement is made, in fact, it's made by Iago, who steals my purse steals trash, but he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. And I think that's what we're talking about. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady for that uh, very eloquent uh, peroration. <laughs> and uh, now I recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Shays, for five minutes. I have a question to ask you, Mr. Dale, but I'll preface my statement by saying that I had one hope uh, that never came true today, that you would have Republicans and Democrats who would sincerely apologize to each of you and not try to belittle what happened to you by suggesting that other people get fired, because that's about as disingenuous as I've ever heard. I don't know people who get fired and then are accused of being crooks who aren't crooks. I don't know people who are being fired or given so little time and then basically stuck in the back of a truck as if they're cattle without even seats to sit on. And I could go on. I'm particularly sorry that my colleague, Mr. Ken Jorsky, who I have a lot of respect for, came in quickly, made his charges and left because I think he owed it to you to hear your entire testimony. And I would have liked to have personally responded to some of his accusations. Since he's not here, I don't feel I can. But I'd just like to say I would apologize for his smearing each and every one of you and not even giving you a chance to apologize and, and to respond. Now, I, Mr. Dale, I do need to ask you some questions. I want to be on record with you as saying that I can't for the life of me justify a fund going into my own personal account. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think it shouldn't happen, and I think you now know why. Yes, sir. And I just want to know if you understand that. Yes, sir, I do. I, okay. You put it in your own account. Uh, your, your money is being, your account is being audited, and now the IRS is taking a look and so on, and I don't even know what the outcome would be, and neither do you, regretfully. But I'm sure you feel that you conducted yourself well. But that was clearly a mistake. The second thing that I, I have to say to you is that I do agree with my colleague on the other side of the aisle that says you, 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 you do bid. And, and what, I, what, I, what I have a difficult time understanding is y you don't bid for each trip, but you bid for jobs. And you say, well, in the course of the year, we may have so many, and you will charge so much for each flight and miles. Why wouldn't that happen? I'm not quite sure I understand what you're Why asking. wouldn't you bid generically for a airline that says, you have our business? You know, anytime we have travel, you get the business. I don't understand how your comment that, well, in, you had to find a, pl a plane, you know, with six hours to go. Why wouldn't you have a number of people who would bid for the business and then be guaranteed a certain price? You wouldn't haggle about the price. You just, you know, there's the business. Oh, yes, you do haggle about the price. No, no, you, no, no you're misunderstanding me, and I, I want to be clear on this. It, it, you have a long-term contract. It's a year's contract. Any business during the year, you get the business, and you, you bid for this. And that's all I'm saying. I, I, do, I do find it difficult that you could not have bid this out. Well, first of all, you have to find somebody that wants to take the bid. We couldn't find anybody that wanted to do the charters except Pan Am. Well, but what Worldwide Travel wanted to come in, and you had Mr. Tomlinson, and he had his people. He wanted to get in. So, I mean, you know, I mean, with all due respect. <laughs> Mr. Shades, you've got to understand that when Air Force One leaves, I've got to have an airplane available to leave too. I have to have an, a company that I can depend on for on time, mechanical and otherwise. 
there is a great deal of pride taken in presidential travel by everybody that's involved with it, the military, the Secret Service, the communications people, and nobody wants a finger pointed at them and said, the president say, why did you cause me to be delayed? I didn't want that, and I wanted a company, and I was expected. I understand that sometimes when you bid out uh, for an elevator in a hotel, you get the worst elevator. Uh, when, I mean, uh, when you build, con construct. And I understand you want the best service, but that can be a contingent if you're not satisfied with the service. But all I'm saying to you is that it is hard for me. I agree with Ms. Maloney on this issue. It is hard for me to accept that something can't be bid out. It could be bid out, and I did. I tried each and every time that I met with airline employees from different airlines to... Uh, yes, Mr. An Smith. added feature of this, which you know, hasn't been brought up, the, the decision as to what airline would get the business was not only Bill Dale's, it was the White House correspondents who were paying for it. And don't make the mistake of thinking that they were not interested in a good that, airline that's operating. That's a valid point. Let me just get to something else before my time runs out. Mr. Dale, um, you left how much in the account? When you left, when you were given two hours and taken in, a, in basically a van and escorted out, how much was in the account to the best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, and I could be wrong on this, but it was over $600,000. Okay. My understanding is when the audit was done, that there was about, or you, know, you had it payable when the report was done. I won't call it an audit. You had 521000 in the accounts payable and the accounts receivable, 366000 And when GAO did a report uh, at the end of 12-31, the account grew from accounts payable $5.7 million and accounts receivable, 5.6 million. Uh, what would explain the incredibly large accounts payable and accounts receivable in, the, in either, both these accounts after you left? Um, I can only assume that uh, as far as the money that they accumulated, they were not paying the bills that I left for them. And, and they weren't collecting the money either? Yet. Well, they collected the money from the people who I had already billed, yes. Yeah. And my understanding is by the GAO report of 124.96 that $200,000 in deposits uh, were not entered in the checkbook. Uh, is that uh, surprising to you? That was the GAO report of January 21st. In fact, it's today's report. $200,000 not deposited in the checkbook. Well, I, I can see it surprises me. It never happened when I well, was there. I do know there's a double standard. I do know that the White House is not holding the Energy Department and the Commerce Department to the same standard they were holding to you. And I am once again going to use my time. I don't know what's in your future, each and every one of you, but I apologize to each and every one of you. And I'm sorry that you didn't get that same sincere apology from people on the other side. You all were screwed. Mm -hmm. uh, gentleman yields back the balance of time. I would now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Mrs. Collins. Um, Mr. Chairman, point of, uh, point of parliamentary inquiry. Uh, in, the, in the passing system, uh, am I entitled to pass uh, until the next, uh, the next person? I would certainly Or is the that. gentlewoman from Illinois entitled to pass? I would, yeah. In that case, I would ask to pass. Very good. And that, in which case, I would now uh, move to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Horn, for five minutes. And may I ask him to yield to me for about 20 seconds? Absolutely. 20 seconds to the chair. Just to make the case that uh, in our discussion with the GAO and in their pre in preparation for the report they issued, they found that, frankly, as I understand, not very many airlines were really interested in bidding on this. And I gather, uh, Mr. Dale and others, that one of the reasons for this is you had a pretty demanding customer uh, group, did you not? That uh, that really liked certain special things that uh, some airlines w would not perhaps be willing to provide or unable to provide. Yes, sir. Uh, so there was a, this was a, a fairly uh, customized service that you were providing and trying to meet the, uh, uh, the wishes of your, of your that's, uh, customers. That's right. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for yielding. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I opened the questioning earlier this morning, I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for pursuing this. And we've heard nothing but sort of minimization by our friends on the minority. And I say to my colleagues that preceded me, Mr. Burton, who has taken much of my remarks and wanted to really pursue this situation, 
Mrs. Morella, who is always humane and puts a wonderful perspective on it. But I want to particularly praise my colleague, Chris Shays. I never knew him till I came here, but for several years before I came here, I watched McNeil Lair, and I watched Mr. Shays of Connecticut conduct as vigorous a pursuit of the truth in the Reagan administration HUD scandal as did the Democratic member of the subcommittee. And I guess my apology today is listen to m many of my good friends on the other side of the aisle, the Democratic side, not sit through this hearing, come in here, wing it, trying to confuse the viewing public, confuse the written record with analogies that are absolutely false, make absolutely no sense. Now let me get into some of this. Mr. Chairman, I've got 10 reports of the General Accounting Office titled Financial Management. They're divided equally between the Customs Bureau and the Internal Revenue Service. Let me just read you a few titles and then we'll agree on putting some of this in the record in titles. Customs lacks adequate accountability over its property and weapons. Customs self-assessment of its internal control and accounting systems is inadequate. Customs did not adequately account for or control its accounts receivable. Customs accountability for seized property and special operation advances was weak. Customs accounting for budgetary resources was inadequate. IRS lacks accountability over its automatic data processing resources. IRS weaknesses increase risk of fraud and impair reliability of management information. IRS, self-assessment of its internal control and accounting systems is inadequate. And finally, important IRS revenue information is unavailable or unreliable. Now, in every one of these reports, and these are all during the Clinton administration, and they're just a handful, there's many more, in every one of these reports, the, I, the General Accounting Office, the agent of the Congress to audit the executive branch on both programmatic audits and financial audits, always has a response from the head of the agency. And as I said earlier, as a university president, when I had the state auditor or the California State University system auditor or the legislative auditor, whoever it was, they always gave the chief executive the draft report and permitted us to write a letter that said where we agree, where we disagree. And these reports have exactly that from the head of the IRS and the head of customs. It is very clear in the questioning that Pete Marwick, a private firm, went in, did a study. None of you ever saw it. None of you ever had a chance to reply. So there was no way a supervising officer could have known anything based on that Pete Marwick report because they only had half the equation. And that's what really disturbs me in this whole operation here that no due process was followed, followed, which is normal process for any audit of a government agency. Now let's talk a little bit about the U.S. attorney. I don't even know the name of the U.S. attorney involved, but let me just say as a student of history, be it Republican United States attorneys or Democratic United States attorneys, they are ambitious. They would like to be judges. Maybe they'd like to be attorney general. And let me talk about federal agencies and the culture of Washington. The FBI, clearly misused by the Clinton White House. And there's no question with any new president, regardless of party, they want to please the president in these executive agencies. Private firms bidding for future contracts, perhaps, on a county. They'd like to please the president. Now, that's just human nature. And we need to view what the FBI did, the United States Attorney did, what Pete Marwick did, was that the fair way to go about it. And what we see here in the testimony from Mr. Watkins and all the rest as we've sat through it, looked at many of the displays, we have a pattern and practice of deceit and abuse by the White House. This isn't letting some poor soul go with a pink slip. And as was said very eloquently by some of you, it's one thing to be let go with a pink slip it's another thing to be fired from your job where you've conducted yourself as a professional and you go home and your child is looking at the TV and says, Daddy, are you really a thief? Or, Daddy, did you misuse the public trust? The fact is a court has ruled in a jury and it's clear from the evidence there was not abuse of the public trust by any of you sitting before us. And apologies are owed not by members of Congress, 
Apologies are owed by the President of the United States and the First Lady, as I said earlier today, and all those that were involved in this travesty. So uh, I must say, Mr. Chairman, seven people, our friends in the minority seem to dismiss seven people and why we're concerned. We're concerned because when you've done something to seven people, it means, as in the, Clinton, as in the Nixon White House, maybe you're doing it to a lot more people. I said this morning we're talking about a White House cancer with a smile, and I say after listening to the rest of the testimony, we're talking about arrogance with a smile. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time, and I would now um, recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Wise. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from California speaks eloquently. Uh, it's not right to do it to seven people. It's not right to do it to 113 people. Uh, it's not right to deny 113 congressional workers uh, their protection uh, just out to fire them hours before. It's not right to a couple of weeks before Christmas to fire 10 or was it 11 uh, members of the House, of the house floor staff. Uh, goodbye, Merry Christmas and goodbye. And so I guess I question these. Um, uh, I question uh, where the, where this leads. I've, uh, when some say seven people, well, I think we also ought to look at overall practices. Nobody seems to have clean hands on this. Um, Mr. Dale, um, the gentleman from Connecticut uh, quite properly pointed out that you have been tried. And I want to preface my remarks by saying I'm not trying to retry you, that I'm going to ask questions. But the issue has been raised by the people who asked you to be here about whether there was political motivation in A, firing you, and B, then whether there was political motivation by the Justice Department or the FBI. And so those questions have to be gotten into. But let me preface my remarks once again by saying you have been acquitted. Uh, the allegations that were made, the indictment that was brought, has been found by a jury uh, to not uh, have substance. And so I just want that on the record. But now we have to get into the motivation of what brought you to the, to the court. I also might add uh, to the gentleman from, from Connecticut, I, it is my understanding, who spoke about Mr. Kondrowski, and he can qu speak quite well for himself, Mr. Kondrowski as well as I and perhaps the chairman, uh, Mr. Kondrowski has, I know earlier today, and I think at this moment, has been dealing with flood problems. He does represent Wilkes-Barre, uh, Pennsylvania, which was probably one of the most hard-hit areas over the weekend. And uh, we've all been involved a lot with FEMA in, in those agencies, uh, as I know the gentleman can appreciate. Mr. Um, let me go back to the question, Mr. Dale, that Ms. Maloney asked. Um, that on the, the criminal case was based on a practice with which you depositing a number of, on different occasions checks into a personal account. There were refunds from different vendors intended to reimburse the press for their expenses. Um, you testified, I believe, that that was a practice you had that no one else knew about it. Uh, I'm not making any allegations about it being illegal. I, I think that you, well, let me ask you, uh, didn't, you, did you not acknowledge that in retrospect it probably was not the best procedure? I've already admitted yes, that. And the question I did have is, you said that you did not share that practice, knowledge of that practice, with any of the gentlemen at the table, many of whom had worked with you for 20, years and more, and why would that be? I guess what I should have said is that I didn't go to any of them and tell them. I did not try to hide it from them. The, the drawer that I kept the money in and the logs, uh, Gary Wright had a key to it. He could have gone in it at any time, if I, and I never attempted to hide it. But there were many things in that office that I came in contact with, day in and day out, in the management of it, that I didn't go and tell them about it. I worked it out myself. And that was just the way the job was. But can it at least be accepted that to an outsider coming in, that would be an unusual practice? That's right. And that's why did I object to the fact that nobody ever came and asked me about it. Nobody, until the day I took the stand, the witness stand in my own trial, has asked me one question about the management of the White House Travel Office. If nobody knew about the practice, how were they to ask you about it? They didn't ask me about any practice. If they had come and talked to me, I would have told them. I told the, the gentleman on the, uh, the day that uh, 
that I turned the money over to him, or I didn't turn the money over to him. He never asked to see any money. He took my word for everything that I told him. And I told him that this money was in a locked door behind my cabinet. I didn't just happen to find it. I knew it was there all the time. Well, Mr. Mr. Dale, in terms of Pete Marwick, uh, did, you, did they raise any questions with you in the course of their review? And did you talk to them about these practices? No, sir. So you're saying nobody at Pete Marwick talked to you? No, sir. Did you? Pete Marwick people would it come to me and ask me where they, they could find a certain file or a certain document over the weekend while they were conducting their review. And I would tell them where to find it, and that's all they ever asked me. Were you aware they were conducting this review? When they, as I testified earlier, when they, the morning when it started, I was told that it was going to be a review of the office. As the day went on, as it got late in the afternoon, it became apparent to me that this was more than just a review. And when the FBI interviewed you, did you tell them about this the, practice? The FBI never interviewed me. I went to trial, never answered one question, was never attempted to talk to by anybody except someone from the GAO called and left a message on my answer machine one day. and. When he didn't get me, he called my attorney. My attorney would not permit me to talk to him at that time because of the investigation. But other than that, nobody ever attempted to talk to me. The, um, uh, and Mr. Wise, yes. I might interject here. I volunteered to go in and talk to the Justice Department. But it would, is it your statement then your attorney would not permit you? Or no, well, I don't know that my attorney wouldn't permit me, but he told me uh, I don't think the Justice Department's interested in talking to you. I see. I thank you. I, I thank the chair. Expired. If I could just close uh, by saying that I think it is my hope that the chair will follow through on uh, obtaining the witnesses that the minorities requested because I think it goes to answering the political, whether there was political motivation, and ultimately goes to answering a lot of the questions that Mr. Dale has raised. Thank the gentleman for his comments, and I might, in response to the gentleman, indicate that, yes, we do intend to pursue that. I would uh, restate what I said earlier this morning, and that is we have requested and, yet not, and not yet received documents from the Justice Department, which we would need to have in order to proceed to a, a discussion of those issues. I must say, in closing, uh, gentlemen, that I was, I'm really, frankly, astonished that uh, you were brought, you were indicted and brought to trial and put through what you were put through without ever having been interviewed by basically your accusers, as I, as I understand it. Is that, uh, is that accurate? A lot of discussion here today about uh, the fact that, you know, other people have fired, 115 people were uh, let go from here. But I think the difference here is, number one, they were aware in June that this was going to happen. You never really knew it until the day, I believe, that you were uh, let go, if that, if that was my understanding of your testimony here today. That's correct. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, the, other, the, the difference here that we have to bear in mind is this is not about how people are let go or how they're pink slipped. It really has to do with, uh, with credibility, and I think that's the, that's the key here in terms of differentiating this from, from other uh, people who have been let go from the job. Here, you, I think it's becoming abundantly clear, were basically sort of designated scapegoats to provide a justification for what we all agree was uh, legitimate. We would not be here today, and you would not be here testifying today, if the White House had done what they had the right to do, which was to tell you, we want you out and we want our people in. And what the difference here was that there was an attempt made, clumsy, awkward, to justify what they otherwise would try to do. It just seems to me that, that it's as simple as that, because all of the records about Pete Marwick and so forth came really after the fact, after the decision had been made uh, that you should have to go. Gentlemen, I want to express to you the appreciation of the committee. Uh, you've had a long day here today, and uh, you've been very, uh, very patient, and you've been very forthright in response to the questions of, uh, of the committee. We're grateful for that. I hope, as I started at the, be stayed at the beginning of this hearing, that you deserved an opportunity to tell your story under oath uh, before the Congress of the United States. And you have had that opportunity. I hope that you feel that you have had that opportunity to get your story out and to have your story told. Because I think, as I said at the beginning, there is a, you know, there